Okay, and we are live. I'm here with Frank Defano. Uh, he has a small YouTube channel. I believe you follow the carnivore diet, right? Uh, that depends on your interpretation of the carnivore diet. Uh, so do you eat like a zero carb, all animal products diet? Yeah, for the most part. I mean, yeah, I do. I mean, in the past few weeks to months, I've experimented with raw milk and raw dairy products and stuff like raw honey that does contain some carbohydrate content to some degree, but strictly animal foods. Okay. All right. Um, close enough. I, I'd call that carnivore diet, really. Um, I know typically a carnivore diet, especially like today and in, in the last few months, it focuses around skeletal muscle tissue and yeah, very few people actually eat organs. No. Um, and there are problems with that. So um, for today, uh, I wanted the debate to focus around the health consequences of a diet like this, the carnivore diet or whatever you'd call it that you're following. Um, we'll discuss things like heart disease, diabetes, cancer. I know you wanted to bring up um, nutrient deficiencies among vegans or something. And that, that's um, a very, that's a very like, you know, it's not a topic that's been researched extensively and just the bioavailability of those plant nutrients in general is uh, it's, it's tough to really have a definite answer on that, but we could definitely discuss it. Okay. Um, why don't we start there then? Yeah, sure. So my, my idea is that, you know, in, if we look at indigenous diets or just basically what humans, even in the past hundred years, you know, if we go back a hundred years, what pretty much every group of humans had to eat was a base amount of animal foods in their diet to get these vitamins. And then they would consume, you know, whatever foods were local to the area, whatever plant foods they had access to prepared in traditional ways. So maybe if you were in Sweden, you would have rye bread with various dairy products, occasionally meat, and maybe some whatever seasonal vegetables or protein. So the premise is that every group of these humans needed these fat soluble vitamins from these animal foods in their diet. And that was constant across all planes of people, whether they had, but they had, whether it was dairy, whether it was fish, whether it was some form of meat, whether it was like the Australian Aborigines where they literally had like hundreds of different wild animal foods, as well as thousands of different wild plant foods. The one constant is that they got a base amount of fat soluble vitamins in their diet. Now what becomes questionable is we have access to through, you know, modern science and modern food accessibility foods and supplements and things that we never had access to before. So that's where it gets really questionable about the bioavailability of those supplements. And if we could actually replicate that nutrient profile in a vegan diet, but the overall problem with this idea is most people don't understand the importance of having a nutrient dense diet. And most people don't really place a value on these fat soluble vitamins. So the whole premise is based off of something that not many people are confident in or, or place an importance on in their diet in general. <clears throat> okay. Um, you know, like a hundred and hundred years ago and further back than that, um, vitamin D deficiency and iodine deficiency was incredibly common among Americans. Yeah. Of, among Americans, but I'm mostly referring to when there were still kind of groups of almost untouched people, not on American diet. You mean like tribes people or hunter gatherers? Yeah, yeah. Like um, I, I, I don't really want to reference Weston Price's book here, but that's kind of those groups of people I'm referring to, like people that are well, still living like off the land, so to speak. Not, not really city people. Or uh, when you when you reference Weston Price, you're not actually like he he was a dentist. So I'm yeah. assuming you mean like the type of people he studied, not yes. like his I'm, assu I'm referencing those specific groups of people and the diets he saw those people following. Okay. Um, you don't think any of them ever suffered from nutrient deficiencies? Not necessarily. I mean, very, each of those tribes had to obtain, they had to do, they had to go out of their way to <clears> get <throat> certain, like in the case of iodine that, I mean, there were some African tribes that would they would gather seaweed and burn it to ashes and use that to get their iodine. Um, and, and a lot of, I mean, tribes would literally, they'd fight over certain sources of food because they needed, they had deficiencies and they needed to get these, wh whether it's a vitamin or a mineral. I mean, you, what did you mention? Iodine and uh, what was the other one you said? 
Well, I said vitamin D and iodine, like those were two big ones. Um, yeah, I mean, that can, I mean, yeah, I mean, not everyone had access to those, those like the fish liver and the, the, those fish organs and tissues that contain large amounts of vitamin D3. So, you know, not every, that's why we see, you know, there was varying height differences between those tribes. Uh, and even in some cases, they, a lot of them had very, very high infant mortality rates where the child could not get enough nutrition during the younger years. Uh, I'm not denying that they didn't, I mean, it's not that they didn't have nutrient deficiencies. It's just that in the ideal context, when they were able to obtain the food they needed, they were in good health. Okay. Um, do you have any evidence that nutrient deficiencies were less common uh, among these sorts of tribes people compared to modern times? I mean, what's that's a very broad question. I mean, you no, would no, literally I mean, have, yeah, I mean, you'd have times where if like, and I've read, and this was when I was reading like some articles about the <clears throat> ab Aborigines and their like very kind of, I guess, not so moral practices and in like times when of famine, if they gave birth to a child, they would literally take that child. They would, I mean, they'd kill it and they'd feed it to the other their other children, you know, very, very apparent, just things that happen in nature, you know, where animals go for weeks and months without food or uh, things happen and the, the crop wasn't good. There are plenty of examples of nutrient deficiencies in indigenous groups. But, you know, for the most part, when these people, you know, these people were in excellent physical health in a lot of cases, except for those specific examples. Okay, uh, what metric are you using to say they're in excellent physical health? Mainly physical, physical facial development, physical stature, overall absence of degenerative disease. Uh, absence of degenerative disease. Um, you know, according to the before, heart. Uh, before they are introduced to <coughs> a modern diet. Okay, uh, what, you know, not necessarily modern diet, but before like refined foods and their their indigenous foods are replaced. Um, atherosclerosis has existed in every population all throughout human history. Um, you should take a look at the horse study. Even pre-agricultural hunter-gatherer populations had atherosclerosis. So, so there is a um, difference between the plaque buildup and calcification of arterial walls. They're both those pe those people actually those people actually from the, from what I don't know if I read exactly what you did, but what I'm thinking in my mind, those people literally had fat marbling in their ar arteries, which yeah. had nothing to do with inflammation. Uh, yeah. Um, that's because they're eating high amounts of saturated fat and cholesterol, or at least enough to cause the buildup of atherosclerosis. Um, are you trying to suggest that uh, uh, calcification of these plaques makes them dangerous? And when they're not calcified, they're not dangerous? I mean, do we have, I mean, do we want to go into like what causes why heart disease is actually caused like the yeah. like is, okay. is that what you're suggesting so, here uh just repeat what you just said are you trying to suggest that calcification of these plaques is what makes them dangerous and they're not dangerous when the plaques aren't calcified no i mean it's mainly the the inflammatory fats and uh oxidized fats rancid fats uh i mean this this is not like this is not like a blanket statement I'm going to make. Like I'm in in regards to just how explaining how heart disease is caused, and it's like literally like a 20 minute explanation to get people to understand that. Okay, well, no, you agree that ancient people, including pre agricultural hunter gatherers, developed atherosclerosis, correct? So atherosclerosis, the definition of it being the buildup of fats, cholesterol, and other substances in and on the arterial walls. I think it's a different, yeah. I think they use a different terminology. I mean, I don't have that. I don't have the, I'm just trying to think of what the reference was that I, where they actually like, because the, there's a difference <clears throat> between the physical having marbling and that in the walls, that's not inflammatory versus the actual, like what this definition of atherosclerosis is. Okay, are you talking about stable versus unstable plaques? No, I'm not. I'm talking, like, I just, I, I have to, let me just do a... Uh, like, a, there's, like, like, I understand there's different degrees in atherosclerosis progression. Like, are, are you saying 
like their atherosclerosis wasn't severe? I'm saying the, <clears throat> the type of atherosclerosis they had had nothing to do with inflammation and was not harmful to their health. What? So atherosclerosis isn't harmful to your health unless it's causing inflammation. Quote we're unquote. not. We're not talking about. That's the thing. We're not talking about. I'm not talking about atherosclerosis. I'm talking about the type of marbling they had in their arteries. Or uh, what do you mean by marbling in their arteries? Um. Just let me, one sec. I'm reading. My uh, guess. Do you have the? Do you have the? Um. You said the horse study. Yeah. That you were mentioning. Um, let me find a link for this you. This is like a this is like a really specific like this is a super specific topic that I didn't uh, I didn't look into the specific references. Um, you should read the study atherosclerosis across four thousand years of human history, the horror study of four ancient populations, and they found. Uh, atherosclerosis even in pre-agricultural hunter-gatherers. Um, I don't know what you mean by marbling along the arterial wall. That's atherosclerosis. Uh, when you have fatty streaks going across the arterial wall, that's atherosclerosis. Um, it sounds like you're kind of confused with different... What's the title of, of the... What's the title of the horse study? Okay, uh, it's let like, me uh, just... It's like horse study... Atherosclerosis across 4,000 years of human history, the horror study of four ancient populations. What were they? Do you, um, what were the, do you know the ancient populations off the top of your head? Um, let's see. Ancient Egypt, ancient Peru, ancestral uh, Pueblones <clears throat> of South Africa, and the Unagin of the Aleutian Islands. <clears throat> yeah, of the Aleutian Islands. Okay, let me just. Do you have the? I you just, just have the. I just have the. Text? I just no. I have the abstract. I just don't have the full data. Uh, okay, well, you don't really need it. Um, they did find atherosclerosis in all of these mummified remains. Um, the point being is this, but this has nothing. But I, I don't know what I don't know what their diets were. I don't know. I don't know anything well, about these people to speculate that's on them. Fine. Well, that's fine, but you're making, like, that's fine, uh, but you're making the claim that ancient hunter-gatherer populations, they were in great health, they didn't suffer from chronic disease. This is not ancient hunter-gatherer, this is 4,000 years of ancient, that's ancient and uh, you can, that's and that's for certain, ancient Egypt did not have, ancient Egyptians, and especially in this period. They weren't hunter-gatherers, I agree. They were, no, they're very far from that. This is, this is Neolithic, this is not really, this no, study well, is not really. Had, well, they the, problem, the problem I have, which is, I just didn't want to, I didn't even want to really go into this because your, your point is speaking on the modern medical terminology of atherosclerosis. But if you're saying that, okay, let's, let's hypothetically say that, okay, let's say atherosclerosis is present, was present in these hunter gatherers, even if it was what, you know, what is like, do you have like a reference for them dropping dead of heart attacks? Like, I don't understand where you're going with this. Even if well, I do, even if I can, which it would probably take me <clears throat> a few minutes of Googling. I don't, maybe even more than a few minutes. If I probably have to ask a few of my buddies if they know what the study I'm referring to was. Even if I can prove that there is a difference between the marbling and the arterial walls of certain indigenous tribes and hunters. Like, let me see if I just Google Maasai. Okay, it sounds like you're confusing uh, mortality from heart disease with actual prevalence of the disease. No, no, I'm saying, um, I'm saying the, you're, you're, I'm saying that atherosclerosis, even if, even if these people did have marbling in their arteries, whatever it may be, what, what is, what is your, like, I don't understand what's your end point. Like we know there's no, an my my point is you're trying to claim these people were were in great health, they didn't suffer from any chronic diseases when they did. They didn't su I mean they didn't suffer from degenerative diseases and they didn't have any Okay, well any what problems. do you mean by degenerative disease? I mean it's it's interesting because if you get to, to like there is um there's this guy uh on the Joe Rogan podcast talking about how 
uh, when the monkeys, these monkeys started eating garbage, they developed tuberculosis very rapidly over the course of a few generations and died. But it's interesting that we see groups of indigenous peoples that when, whether it was European settlers or people from the countries that have subsisted at, with like these diseases for periods, these populations were literally, even though they were in perfect health and on their indigenous diets, they were completely wiped out by certain diseases. So yeah, that's because they didn't that, have close proximity to animals. They didn't have agriculture. So they didn't actually get used to these diseases. Uh, they didn't have that immune system built up. So they got wiped out. Yeah. I mean, I'm bringing that up. Is that, are those the diseases you're referring to, or are you referring no, to just I was, like I was heart disease and specifically, and I still don't understand what you mean by degenerative disease. You mean like Alzheimer's? Yeah. Yeah. Degenerative okay. Disease, well, I mean, nobody Alzheimer's, lived long diabetes. enough to get Alzheimer's back then. Have you, I mean, do you understand that any, any sort of study done on an indigenous group based off of mortality, if like, are you saying they live to 30, 40 years old only? That's life well, expectancy. No, That's that not... was the average. Uh, that is affected by infant mortality, but that was the average. These and two, these, if you any, any like sort, if you look at any up any sort of tribe, indigenous Aborigines, there are plenty. I mean, the majority of these people, barring getting stabbed with a spear, live into. I mean, what's your measure for for life? Like we have people dropping. We have now. We have babies getting cancer we have women miscarrying at rates higher than we've seen before we have all these modern problems and degenerative disease with young people dying and now well, explain degenerative I, disease i'm still not clear what you mean by that um let me if you want like, me to say specific things uh well just explain what you mean by degenerative any, disease degenerative like disease, any any disease that's that we spe that are kind of modern in a sense that they've any disease that has raised over the past, you know, 40, 50 years from obesity to uh, diabetes, uh, arthritis, Alzheimer's, uh, all, all of those diseases for the most part that uh, we can speculate <clears throat> are caused by modern lifestyle, modern diets and things like that. Okay. Well, things like diabetes, uh, it is largely affected by body mass. If you're obese, you're at a massively increased risk of diabetes. Physical activity affects it. So I wouldn't expect to find high rates of diabetes in hunter-gatherer populations, even if they're eating a lot of animal products, just because they eat so little calories, their body mass is so low, and they have so my, much my, oh, my overall My overall point but, in this is if there were <laughs> If there were consequences and any problems that we're seeing now from what your atherosclerosis things you're claiming, where is any evidence that th these problems occurred in these groups of people? There isn't well, any. Again, horse, like the horse study I just referenced. Um, that's not the that population has, has had atherosclerosis. The that, thing that's is, past four. That's not. That's four thousand years. Neolithic is. The Neolithic period no, is what, like 12, 13,000 started? This does not, this has nothing to listen, do with what I'm talking about. <clears throat> listen, um, just because the, like a certain group of people entered the Neolithic age and started agriculture, that doesn't mean every human population practiced agriculture around that time. Again, that's if you take a look I the said study, with, with this study that you keep saying the horse study, I don't have the whole abstract. I can't read. And I'm sure that they didn't even <laughs> write down what these people were eating. You don't know those things. How you can't would they know what that. That's my point. This study doesn't matter. Well, they're you're still pre-agricultural hunter-gatherer populations. This is not, this is, this has nothing. You don't know. You're saying ancient Egyptians, ancient Peruvians. I'm not saying ancient Egyptians. No, uh, some of the African. No, Egypt, ancient Egyptians, ancient Peruvians, ancestral. We don't know the diets of these people. And I can't look at the data. Well, this is no, not, but the point is they're pre-agricultural hunter-gatherer populations, not the Egyptians, but the Africans. But they're lumped together with these other people. Like this, this study they're is not, not lumped together. They they looked at their their rates of atherosclerosis in these mummies, and the pre agricultural hunter gatherer populations still had atherosclerosis. I'm saying I'm, I'm saying three different things pretty much about this study that I think makes it inadmissible. From <clears throat> it, the lack of data I have to analyze this, we shouldn't even look into it further. Two, hypothetically, even if they did have atherosclerosis and problems. 
what is your like what is your end summary that they just had atherosclerosis you, you don't have anything about you know their their life expectancy the disease rates of these people what they died from you don't have that data and no, um it's it's just simply this, looking this at not, rates of atherosclerosis my, like this is pointless this is like no, i don't i shouldn't have even got like yes this is exactly pointless Why you don't have pointless? Because if you actually wanted to talk on something specifically like this, it would take like an hour or two of just looking at the data of the studies and, and trying to make well, sense of it, as opposed to no, just making no. a blanket statement about atherosclerosis. Frank, I, I'm not like, I don't think you understand what I'm saying. Um, you're making the claim that pre-agricultural hunter-gatherer populations didn't suffer from chronic diseases like heart I'm disease, I'm not making, diabetes. I'm not, I'm, I'm explaining to you that if you want to prove that this and I have to be apparently very specific. If you want to prove there is some sort of detrimental effect of atherosclerosis or any, I'm not necessarily saying that. I'm asking you to prove that your idea of atherosclerosis and all these saturated fat things, where is the body count? What is what is your basis? You know, this going into this discussion, there shouldn't be any. Sorry. Frank, Frank, um, you're conflating mortality from heart disease with prevalence of the disease. If we were to go back a hundred years ago in this country, uh, heart disease deaths from heart disease would be massively reduced just because uh, prevalence of death from infectious disease was massively high. So if you were to go back like 4,000 years and look at these uh, ancient hunter-gatherer populations, they probably had a high prevalence of heart disease because they ate enough saturated fat and cholesterol to build up plaques in their arteries, but the rates of deaths from the disease were very, very low because one, the life expectancy wasn't long enough for heart disease to actually become like clinically significant where they'd actually suffer heart attacks. Um, and they just die from everything else, from infectious disease, warfare, injuries, things like that. And nutritional deficiencies, which I'm sure were quite common as you admitted to, because these people uh, did have to rely on seat, like just, you know, the food they actually gather. So, so, it's you, very so you're, on you're, you're completely basing this off of the, the life expectancy that you're referencing. Well, that's what you're basing they did this have off. a lower life expectancy. Uh, and that's part you, of the reason. You, you can't just say they did have a lower life expectancy. You have to say, well, they did. you have to show the data and say why uh -huh. they had a lower life expectancy. And, well, uh, and a huge factor. Well, the biggest factor is child mortality. Yes, uh, but infant, infant mortality. So infant mortality yeah. means that their speculative age is what 60, 70, 80, once they passed that developmental stage. That so, is a, um, a well, listen, mortality. listen, there's two, there's two ways of measuring average life expectancy. There's a way where you include child mortality, uh, which does obviously like, especially in these populations, it skews it more towards a much younger age and you can calculate it, uh, by life expectancy, once you reach a certain age, I think normally it's 12 or something. But you, um, you can't, you, you can't just say, it. you cannot say these people had atherosclerosis and the reason they didn't die as a result of it is because they didn't live long enough when you can't yeah, can. actually furnish information. I absolutely can. Life expectancy. I you absolutely can. say can. it, but it has um, no merit because you no, don't have a study on the life expectancy and what the context is. Well, what do you mean? Like, even if we go back a hundred years, uh, you're mortality just, what from heart are, disease what massively is massively reduced for life because expectancy? of infectious disease. What is the data that you're looking at for life expectancy? What is that data you're you're talking about? Well, uh, look, Frank, life expectancy has increased in modern times. That's just an indisputable fact. Even when you account okay, for child. Okay, okay, hold on. We're gonna let's move on to another topic. I'll ask this one more time. If not, let's move on to something else. You, your basis <clears throat> is on that they didn't live long enough, but what like study or what article or what are you referencing for the life expectancy that you're saying? What exact, what group of people are you referencing? What, what you're just making up numbers. That's what you're doing. Okay, no, Frank, uh, I'm not referencing any particular research here. It's just well known that pre-agricultural hunter-gatherer populations had a lower life expectancy. Because- uh, when you account for no, child no, mortality. Not, no, when you, with no, even when you account for child mortality, you're saying they live just as long as we do today. If, if the if that period of developmental, developmental period, the child mortality was passed, they yeah, would. That's live, what I said. They would live to 60, 70, 80. There's and this. I is believe I many, believe it ranges from fifty-five to sixty-five, depending on the group you're you're referring to. And then and then in it. So let's say that it, that is the hypothetical. We and then. 
you're saying that then they would have died from heart disease if they did live. So where's all the, the history of these people that did live past child stages and, and, and people that didn't get killed? You're saying all of them, every single person in all of these tribes was killed before they had the chance to die of heart disease? That's a very- no, not every thing. single one. But every, so everyone that got to 70 would just drop instantly drop dead of a heart attack. That's what you're saying. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying prevalence of heart disease existed. It's just that it didn't develop to the point where it's clinically significant. And I've, I asked you like three in times, cases, where is the, where is the, you know, where's the body count? Where's the, no, like the problem is both well, what wait, I'm wait, saying, wait. both hold what on. I'm saying, hold on, hold on, both what I'm saying and both what you're saying. Honestly, at this point, there's no real merit to it. And I'd like just to move on to another topic because we're both making statements about data that we're not 100% sure on and that we can't reference. Can we move on to something besides? Okay, well, no, this is actually kind of important, Frank. Um, like, I want to know what you're actually trying to claim here. Are you trying to suggest that pre-agricultural hunter-gatherer populations had the same average life expectancy as modern humans, even when you account for uh, infant mortality? All right, let me see if this answers that question. In... And we're not really even talking about <clears throat> pre-agricultural hunter-gatherers. We're talking about people that were still living in almost like a primitive way where they would have, you know, maybe they weren't completely hunter-gatherers like indigenous aborigines subsisting only off of wild plant and animal foods. Maybe they were a group of people like, like maybe the Gaelics who had 50 to 60% of their calories from fish. And then they had a lot of oats and various uh, vegetables that grew in that area. Maybe like this group of people that once they... And this is, I mean, this is a group of people that might not have had such high infant mortality problems, but once they got past that stage of child development, once they got past that, then yeah, then they would live a happy, healthy life pretty much. And let me see if I could find a study, I think off the top of my head. Uh, okay, uh, Frank, the point I'm trying to make here is heart disease did exist all across human history, in every population, even when you look at pre-agricultural hunter-gatherers. Um, all you can say, now, what, the argument you you can make, no, listen, let me finish. The argument you can make is that they had lower rates of deaths from heart disease, but that doesn't really matter. Uh, they had a lower average life expectancy and a higher risk of death from things like infectious disease, injury, malnutrition, literally every other thing was more likely to kill you from heart disease than heart disease. Um, and part of that is because of their, their overall diet and lifestyle. Like now, I mean, you can become incredibly obese, eat insanely shitty processed foods. Um, so, you know, typically they wouldn't get heart disease, develop heart disease as quickly, but it, it still occurred. Uh, and what I'm arguing, yeah, this is, this is fucking comical, man. Your whole what? basis for this argument, they dug up a bunch of 4,000 year old mummies and looked at their arteries. Are you nuts, yeah. man? This is, this is. This is completely fucking ridiculous. I'm not talking about this 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 anymore. If you're using this study as a reference for this, uh, oh, okay, Frank. Uh, did heart disease exist in ancient populations? Yes or no? I I mean, you don't have evidence for it. I don't have yeah, evidence do. against it. Yeah, no, you don't. This, that is not yeah, evidence do. for it. Uh, yeah, the, the horror study I just referenced is evidence for it. They had atherosclerosis in their if you arteries. Wanna, dude, if you want to keep referencing this study, I have to know well, it's what, good these research. Are, what these people are eating. It doesn't no, it's matter not what they were research. eating. No, it's, Frank, it's completely irrelevant what they were eating. The fact is, ancient populations had heart disease. And but, we know but these they're are not, not eating things these like... Are not, these are not any groups of people that I would talk about or I would reference on my side of the argument. That's why I've been saying okay, for the past 20 matter. minutes... We should move on to something else if this is the studies we're going to talk about and we're, if we're just going to like hypothetically speak about things. Like, <sighs> this is, to me, this is pointless. It really Okay, is. I, I just want to make it clear that heart disease has existed in every human population throughout history. It doesn't matter what their their diets were, whether we know their diets. The fact is heart disease has been prevalent all throughout human history. With this shoddy research that's been done it's on shoddy. mommy. What do you mean? Let like they found, they, you, they found dude. mummified remains and they, they x-rayed them and they found, um, they found atherosclerosis. How is that shoddy research? So what are we going to, you want to like fly over to Egypt? You want to dig up a few bodies and start looking at their heart from like 3000 years ago? Like this is completely, this to me, the study is just completely ridiculous. And why even if on, on well, the premise that, that these, well, sorry, Frank, Frank, listen, you're making a statement on some mummies dug up 3000 no, years Frank, ago and listen. applying it to everything in the past before I, that. Look, Frank, Frank, um, 
why is that a bad way of determining prevalence of heart disease in ancient populations? Do you have a better oh method of God. research? You're using the term ancient populations, and you're saying, and this is a 4, study done. isn't ancient? This is still in the Neolithic period. This is not. 4,000 isn't ancient? I mean, what depending on whatever your definition of ancient is, but I'm not talking about ancient mummies. I'm talking about various indigenous groups that, yeah, and that f followed these diets. And, Frank, do you know what mummified know, means? Yes, preserved. Well, you For can. The most part. Well, no. Listen, um, mummified just means it. It doesn't mean there has been some sort of human intervention in preserving the corpse, like with the what the Egyptians did. Uh, it just means it's remains of a human being that have been preserved um, in in any manner. Uh, like in, in Africa, for instance, like you can find mummified remains that have just been buried in the sand, and because it's so dry. Uh, their bodies I know what fucking mummified is. You don't have to like. <laughs> right. So, so Frank, um, I'm just asking you: Do you have a better, better method of trying to figure out the prevalence of atherosclerosis in these ancient populations than digging up mummified remains and seeing, like, doing uh, CAT scans or X-rays and seeing, or MRIs, uh, and seeing uh, whether or not they have atherosclerosis in their in their arteries? Dude, my my point is this, like this whole idea <coughs> and i think i've kind of explained this loosely over the past 30 minutes it's it just this is not something that's relevant you're taking this well, you're, you're digging up people from 4000 years ago you don't know what they ate you don't know what their doesn't lifestyle matter. was doesn't matter. you don't know <coughs> you know you don't know what the what diseases they were dying from you can't use this that, that like, doesn't matter. this is completely frank, ridiculous that, frank that's completely irrelevant the point i'm making is these ancient people, including pre-agricultural hunter-gatherer populations, had high prevalence of atherosclerosis. But you're lumping. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You, what you, lump, to... you can't lump pre-agricultural, which would be over 12, 15,000 years ago, with not this study. That's completely uh, crazy. No, no, that's no, no, com no, that's no, completely no, 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 ridiculous. Frank, Frank, not every single group in human history was at at the same level of technological advance advancement. Um, for instance, uh, what Rome was using Bronze Age technology well before um, another group that actually lived pretty there's close still, to them. They're still using there are Stone still Age technology. Indigenous, there are still indigenous civilizations now. I think they're off the yeah, there are. Um, coast of whatever. But that's and not the point, is, the point is, the point The point is, if, what I'm saying, what, if, what in my mind, if you want to say this, you would have to have a specific reference from a period of time. And my point that I'm staying with is, we cannot, we're speculating, all we're doing is speculating with information that is not correct. That's all we're doing right now on this What topic. information isn't correct? If, if you were to say to me that in these four specific people, ancient Peruvians, ancient Pueblans, uh, th these four specific groups of people within the past few thousand years, and we don't know how old this corpse was, how old these people, like, we don't- Well, they do. They, there are methods of determining what-, what uh, Yeah, but I don't, I, the, the point is I don't have- I don't have the data. You're not. You're not giving me specific examples and going in depth on this data. We, we don't have <laughs> anything we can really reference and and make something reasonable out of it. You're just making the statement Frank, saying that in these specific people within the past four thousand years have atherosclerosis. Okay, that doesn't apply to really what I'm talking about. That doesn't apply. You can't say that applies to all indigenous people. You cannot say <clears> something <throat> like that. Uh, yeah, you can. Um, when you look at you can, but it wouldn't from be correct. that long ago, from that long ago, from very different uh, backgrounds, uh, there were pre-agricultural hunter-gatherers, uh, and there were people from Neolithic era populations like the Egyptians. They all had high prevalence of atherosclerosis. So uh, it's very safe to assume that every other population in human history has suffered from atherosclerosis. Uh, and this is the best data available. Um, the only way to look at atherosclerosis prevalence in ancient populations is to find mummified remains, do an MRI on their corpses, and see whether or not their like their arteries are clogged with but atherosclerosis. But this, this has this has nothing. To, this literally does not matter because it has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. You're just <clears throat> bringing up something like, like, this is not a point I would talk on. Like, I'm not. Okay, well, I'm not I mean, disagreeing with you that. I'm not disagreeing with <clears throat> I had atherosclerosis for these in these mummified remains from 4,000 years ago to now. Okay, well, I'm not disagreeing. There, I'm saying okay, that it's okay. pointless to talk about this. Frank, is there any population in the world that doesn't have any amount of atherosclerosis prevalence? What can you modern or ancient? 
I'm not talking. We've been talking for 40 minutes about this bullshit topic, and we've really kind of come to. This is just a waste of my time. It really is. Like, okay, well, no, Frank, you were trying to claim that these people eating a traditional diet, quote unquote, uh, that were mostly hunter gathering, uh, they had really low rates of disease. And I'm trying to point out that's not the case. They have high prevalence of atherosclerosis. But, so, uh, uh, but clearly, what they were eating was causing them to have disease. Now, whether or not they died from those diseases is a different thing. But they did have these diseases. You're saying these groups of people had atherosclerosis, but the study you're showing has nothing to do with the people I'm talking about. Okay, well, do you have any evidence that the people you're talking about uh, did not suffer from atheros atherosclerosis? This is the, the burden of proof is not on whether or not they had atherosclerosis because you're doing studies on people that you don't know what their diet is. That is my, the whole basis of me explaining this is that they are on a particular diet. Okay, so if right, you're not so... able to tell me what the diet is, if you're not able to tell me specifics, then. Well, there's... Frank, okay, uh, show me uh, like a hunter gatherer population or whatever population of people you want, uh, show me that they don't have uh, like atherosclerosis or it's incredibly insignificant among their culture. I wish I had time to do this instead of spending Google and studies <clears> that I don't know exist. Okay, Frank, um, I think you know, at this point it's very safe to assume that atherosclerosis has existed all throughout human history in Iraq. No, because the yeah, atherosclerosis existed in the mummies your buddies dug up for the past 4,000 years. That's what you're saying. Okay, well, do you have any evidence otherwise? Like, again, this is the only evidence we have. Uh, the only way to measure atherosclerosis prevalence in ancient people is to dig up mummified uh, remains and see oh, whether just, or not atherosclerosis is in their I got, I got one thing arteries. here uh, okay, that I, I just Googled. I've never looked at this before. Abstract is the hearts and aorta of 50 Maasai men were collected at autopsy. These pastoral people are exceptionally... I, I'll link... Uh, is there a chat in Google Hangouts that I could just... Uh, yeah, there is. Um, uh, let me see. Right here. Uh, here you go. <clears throat> uh, the I meat intake of... Do you want me to read it or do you want... The meat intake of animal fat exceeds that of American men. Measurements of the aorta showed extensive atherosclerosis with lipid infiltration and fibrous changes, but very few complicated lesions. The Coronary arteries showed intimate thickening by atherosclerosis, which equal that of old U.S. men. The Maasai vessels enlarge with age to more than compensate for this disease. It is speculated that Maasai are protected from their atherosclerosis by physical fitness, which causes their coronary vessels to be capacious. Yeah, um, okay. Next study. So, so just again, one, one second, they have heart disease. Just, Frank, they have heart disease. The study you just linked me well, admits disease, that they have high prevalence of heart disease. Protective mechanism such a freedom. And so you should also my, know. So this is, what, this is what I was... This is why I was asking you earlier that you need to show what, why these people aren't dropping dead of heart. Like, there's no data showing that these people are, were dropping Frank, dead of heart attacks. It doesn't matter. Frank, it does it doesn't, no, no, no. Frank, Frank, the, what matters is prevalence of disease. Um, there are a lot of different things that can modulate deaths from disease, including life expectancy and uh, rates of death from other illness, but they do have heart disease. It, I, feel, it, I feel like I feel like people are going to feel like this is, has not been productive so far. So can I try to like just explain <laughs> what I think you're trying to get at and then what I'm trying to get at real quick? Sure, sure. So initially, my point was to kind of say, okay, yes, they have atherosclerosis and buildup of arterial plaque in the wall, but it would be very difficult from our modern understanding of medicine to explain why these people are not dropping dead of heart attacks. But they evidently were not, despite modern evidence saying that atherosclerosis does cause heart disease. Now, for me to say something like in this, in this study that says the Maasai vessels enlarge with age to more than compensate for disease, for me to say that these people are, prevalent. yeah, for me to say that these people are immune to the disease is, is not really, to me, that is not like, to me, a marketable or like something that would be something that people would just take for granted as the atherosclerosis and the heart disease and the plaque buildup in the arterial wall has been something that's been shown in such a negative light, especially in the context of modern medicine. Whereas it's something that would in these people, it occurs naturally. They have, and, and they have no problems with it. And oh, well, they do. Um, it's just that typically the enlargement of their blood vessels compensates for this. 
Um, also, again, um, higher prevalence of of disease in, in other aspects like infectious disease. It might modulate their risk of death from heart disease. Um, you also have to consider, like, these people have a very different lifestyle. They eat very low-calorie diets. Um, they also use a lot of medicinal herbs and medicine, and they also often suffer from infectious diseases, including uh, things like malaria. And uh, that does affect uh, risk of death from heart disease, uh, because a lot of these diseases actually reduce serum cholesterol. Yeah, there's like um, there's a group of people that are like immune to malaria, right? As well. Um, you hear about not that? Not completely yeah. immune. Well, not uh, immune. They, I mean, they have it, but like they don't really suffer from it. Well, uh, it's it's because of sickle cell anemia. A yeah, lot of Africans right. have it. Um, so yeah, like I mean, there's adaptations in these in these sorts of cultures to the diseases in the area. But I mean, um, that also can uh, modulate uh, the risk for some of these diseases. I mean, okay, uh, the Maasai, their their blood vessels widen somehow with age. Um, that could be a, a genetic thing. That could be an effect of like their specific lifestyle of eating a very, very low calorie diet. But you have to understand most of the, all of these indigenous groups that I'm referring to subsisted on what we eat now, if not less than the amount of calories we eat now. And they were all similar in regards to their levels of physical activity and physical stress that they had to make <coughs> their lives. I mean, the constant between these people that are immune to these diseases is those factors. Um, they tend to eat low calorie diets and they're all also often infected with uh, parasites and infectious diseases, uh, particularly malaria. And those two things reduce uh, serum cholesterol. Uh, and serum cholesterol is the principal risk factor for heart disease. So um, again, uh, like you can reference these tribes people all you want, but you're not really understanding their real diet, lifestyle, uh, disease prevalence, and how that affects heart disease risk. Um, again, uh, like looking at the Maasai, you, you can't just say, oh, saturated fat and cholesterol doesn't cause heart disease because the Maasai eat a very low calorie diet. They have a proportionately high amount of physical activity, very low body mass, and they also often suffer from infectious diseases and parasitic infections. Like that just, that claim just doesn't make any sense. So in, in regards to if the only way that wouldn't make sense is if the parasitic diseases you're referencing and the, the, and the malaria and stuff, which wasn't present in these people specifically, we can, I don't know if we could assume that, but um, it, it's if those parasites yeah, and those suffer from malaria. I mean, it's, I wouldn't, I don't know if that's a blanket term for all Messiah, uh, but Th those previous factors you mentioned don't really matter because those can be replicated. But the malaria, if, if the malaria and the sickle cell thing was proven to be the, literally the only reason why they're alive, then that's a different discussion to be had. But if that can't be said, then it doesn't really, you know, like, I mean, from like, <coughs> what, what is, what is, what is the point of you saying that these people were on like a low calorie diet that was restricted that it, because well, are you implying that? Are you, are you implying that? Are you implying right now that just if people follow a carnivore diet now, they're just over consuming way too much meat, and that's this isn't relevant? Because I agree with that. If that's um, the case, no. My problem is if you're eating any, like pretty much any amount of meat, you have to be on a very, very strict plant-based diet to not cause progression of atherosclerosis. Um, and especially if you're on a very heavy meat diet, like you are, even if you're eating things like organs and uh, things other than skeletal muscle, uh, your, your intake of saturated fat and cholesterol is way, way too high. And you're, you're causing uh, buildup of plaques in your arteries, which will eventually lead to uh, like clinically significant heart disease where you're going to have an increased risk of heart attack, stroke. So let's say hypothetically, I replicate the exact lifestyle of the Maasai with the exception of having, you know, sickle cell anemia and uh, well, parasitic they infections. They don't all have sickle cell, and sickle cell is actually a big risk factor for stroke. Well, let I mean, so let's say I do replicate the lifestyle and diet of the Maasai. Would you believe that I would develop these conditions where I would be you pretty would. much? You think so? Uh, even the study you just referenced, uh, it said they have high prevalence of heart disease. It's just that uh, as they age, their vessel walls enlarge. 
Um, I don't know why that happens. Um, I'd actually like to see other research on this, but um, you would still get heart disease. Uh, they like the study you referenced yourself says they have very high prevalence of heart disease. Um, it's just that a lot of them get away with it because of confounding uh, other confounding factors. So why would that not apply to my diet right now? Why would I mean? You don't have the same. You don't have the same diet, and you don't have the same lifestyle. I mean, how sure of that are you? Well, do they eat cheese? Do they do they eat steak every day? I don't. I mean, I should have made one thing very clear before this. I follow pretty much. I mean, my diet, if you compare it to a Masai diet, it's pretty much the same thing. It really is. Uh, I, Whereas, I've, seen, I've seen daily, like I've seen a few of your food vlogs. No, it's not. Well, what I ate yesterday was I had, I had some, I stewed, I stewed the vertebrae of lamb and then I had a little liver and, and some other organs and that's all I ate, small amount, active sorry, all day. You, you ate lamb, liver, and what else? The ver vertebral column, the spinal cord, I boiled it down in, in a pot with, uh, and then just had the meat. So you ate lamb, skeletal muscle tissue, you had liver, and Well, spinal cord. you know, I mean, most people don't, I mean, people don't really eat that vertebral tissue. It has a lot of collagen, a lot of uh, high vitamin fat. There's just tissues in there that would be kind of, this is something that uh, like a, a tribes person would eat. And then the day before that, I just had, a bunch of organs and some blood and and that was really it but my my diet for the most part has been majority you know i have organs every day majority of my calories come from fairly lean uh well not majority of my calories but more roughly half my calories come from skeletal meat and in the past i used to have a lot of raw dairy too uh, as that. So I would say my diet is very, very different than what most carnivores and zero carb people are following. Well, I'd agree with that. Um, I'd still say it's quite a bit different than the Maasai. Um, they like their primary calories, calorie sources, milk, uh, and blood. They tend to avoid killing their cattle. Uh, mm -hmm. and you know, they, they do occasionally eat steak and shit. Uh, and they also do, uh, consume medicinal herbs, mm -hmm. uh, in their region. Um, but the point is, uh, their diet causes heart disease. So why would you eat a diet that causes heart disease? It's just that for whatever reason, maybe it's confounding lifestyle factors, or maybe they have a some sort of genetic, like a, like a genetic uh, resistance to the disease where their arteries will actually expand. Um, they get they get away with not dying from heart disease at a very high rate, but the prevalence of heart disease is extraordinarily high. So why would you eat a diet like that when there's ways of just like avoiding heart disease entirely? Well, I, I can I can answer that in a sec, but I did want to ask <coughs> you what would be, you know, you're saying the Messiah get a lot of their, yeah, they do consume a lower calorie diet. They do get the majority of their calories from much more nutrient dense foods. But what would be the concern about, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I obviously agree that eating, you know, two, three pounds of grain fed ribeye from Costco is completely ridiculous, but. In, in just regards to like, what would be the reason specifically that you think that would be uh, so much worse? Just in the context of diet, like let's say you took a Maasai tribesman and he just ate the grain fed steak a day instead of what he was eating. Why would that be? I'm just trying to, I mean. I'm not saying it's necessarily worse. I'm just saying um, like these diets that are high in saturated fat cholesterol, they cause mm -hmm. heart disease. And the the research you linked to me demonstrates that they have very high prevalence of heart disease. Mm. So why would you eat a diet that causes heart disease when you can avoid it entirely by eating a relatively low fat whole foods vegan diet? Well, I mean, as, as what I spoke about earlier where every group of people had a base amount of fat soluble vitamins in their diet in order to be in what I would consider ha have proper physical development, proper <laughs> physical health. It, it, it's just that base Fat, are you like me, like more like personal, like me, why I do it? Or as opposed to like, just like, cause right now I'm trying to explain why someone would do it as opposed to just me personally. No, why would, well, why would you or anyone eat a diet okay, that's okay. high saturated fat and cholesterol, which has been proven to cause heart disease when you could avoid heart disease entirely? Because those are the only foods accessible really in nature that have the vitamins and well, mostly vitamins required to just survive. That's basically it.
Uh, okay. Um, so what uh, nutrients can you not get on a vegan diet? And uh, would that would the lack of these nutrients actually reduce uh, or sorry, increase like all cause mortality risk to the point where it's more worth it uh, from a health perspective to eat a diet high in saturated fat and cholesterol, which causes heart disease, as opposed to eating a vegan diet, which lowers your risk of chronic disease, but supposedly you won't get enough of these nutrients and that that'll cause health problems. So, I mean, th this goes back to what I said earlier about you know, now we have access to modern supplements and extracts of these certain vitamins that can be used on a vegan. I mean, no one, I've, I've <clears> literally <throat> never seen a vegan that takes all of these supplements, but I theoretically what we could. What supplements do I need uh, as a vegan? Yeah, I mean, theoretically we could replicate. I mean, under the assumption you get vitamin D3 from the sun. Uh, well, uh, listen, um, virtually every group of people uh, is vitamin D deficient. Um, yeah, I agree with that. You're talking about so, now, right? Sorry? You're talking about like now? I, I think it's existed all throughout human history. Um, maybe uh, I mean, there are some few exceptions, but... Why, 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 would you uh, think, why would you think people who spent like five, eight, ten hours a day outside a day were vitamin D deficient? Oh, like there are being studies on uh, freaking Californian surfers and they're still vitamin D deficient. They spend all day in the sun, uh, like almost naked. I mean, but um, a Californian like, surfer is not like so. You need <clears throat> other you need other vitamins and minerals and things to metabolize vitamin D three. It's not just right. I understand just, that, yeah, but it's it's not very reliable to rely on just the sun for D three. Um, and that's why there's a massive prevalence of vitamin D deficiency, especially with people who have darker skin. I think in the United States, like eighty three percent of blacks have vitamin D deficiency. Um, so it's just a good idea to supplement D3. I agree. And yeah, I mean, why, I agree, I agree with Frank. Frank, here's the issue. Um, let's say like cert, like these certain fat soluble vitamins, you can only get it from animals or you take a supplement. Yeah. Why is the supplement worse than eating the animal products that also come along with saturated fat cholesterol, which increases heart disease risk? Uh, yeah, I could speak on each of them individually. So vitamin D3, uh, I'm not... Uh, I don't, you know, I looked into what the D, the vegan version of D3 was made from, and I honestly it's couldn't from, think. Uh, it's made from like a type of fungus. Uh, it's a type it's of fungus. But uh, yeah, that's to me, that doesn't make sense because I didn't know that. I thought D2 occurred in fungus. I didn't realize it was D3. Uh, but, D2 occurs in fungus, but there's also a, a certain type of fungus uh, that produces D3. Yeah. So, I mean, in the case of like D3 made from these foods or, or lanolin, sheep's wool, they you have to use hexane. They have to use solvents to extract the D3, and then they use a carrier oil. And I usually just rub the oil on my skin, so I don't necessarily think that the the supplements are too harmful. But what I've noticed, per, like I've personally had insomnia problems when I just take a supplement uh, without supplement? the present without the presence of the other fat soluble vitamins. Okay, um, so what? What supplement are you talking about? Just any like D3 and M in uh, any sort of olive oil or whatever. Okay. Um, I mean, what's the, what, I mean, I'm just curious. What's the, I mean, the D3, I agree with you. And I think everyone should supplement D3. So do you want to okay. just move on to the other vitamins? Well, yeah. Um, I, I remember you mentioning on Twitter, like when you DM'd me, uh, you mentioned vitamin A in particular. Yeah. So um, vitamin A in the form of retinoic <laughs> acid uh, to my understanding, the only supplement that comes close might be retinal palmitate and it retinoic acid is used. We know it's used for a lot of, uh, just cell functions in the body in general. And we know that the body does convert carotenoids to retinoic acid at various rates, depending on the food in the context, uh, that, you know, a small amount of saturated fats are present, but nothing to me indicates either from my personal anecdotes with consuming large amounts of carotenoid foods with fat and studies that I've looked at. Uh, and the problem I have is that it's questionable. We don't really have data showing, you know, we know some groups of people can't metabolize the carotenoid uh, to, vi to retinoic acid at all. And we know that this form of retinoic acid in humans is just incredibly important for uh, health in general. Okay. Um, do you have any research showing that vegans have a higher prevalence of vitamin A deficiency than meat eaters? I mean, it's not necessarily about, in this discussion about vitamin A, it's not really about deficiency. It's about, uh, you know, having a high vitamin A content can kind of just help meta, 
uh, optimize just your whole metabolism in general. <clears throat> and uh, I mean, okay, you know, um, you, human human store human store fat soluble vitamins in their liver and their tissue. So I think to answer that question, we would have to literally have data on, you know, the liver, the vitamin A store in the liver of a vegan versus different people. We'd need data to kind um, of vegans have that lower vitamin A status, but they don't have lower rates of vitamin A deficiency. And that's not associated with increased prevalence of any type of disease. Uh, your body, yeah, yeah, listen, the, well, no, listen, let me, let me finish. Um, your body regulates vitamin A production because you need a range of it. Uh, mm -hmm. Too little is harmful, too much is harmful. Uh, it can cause uh, liver problems and also uh, bone abnormalities. And uh, it, like it's especially a risk for women uh, because they have a higher risk of uh, bone diseases. But uh, your, your own body synthesizes vitamin A and it regulates vitamin A production. So all, th those, those liver sorry. problems and those well, bone wait, diseases. Listen, listen. Well, listen, let me finish. So why would you take like a fully formed source of vitamin A and consume that to ensure that you're not vitamin A, de a deficient when your body regulates this process very well on its own? You, so you, you're increasing risk of having too much vitamin A in your, in your system. You mean, you, you, what you're saying, you mean consuming like liver is a risk for too much <laughs> vitamin A, whereas if you just get the yeah. plant form, your body will regulate it properly. Yeah, yeah Okay, exactly. so... My problem with that is all, uh, and let me just find my my studies on it. Um, uh, any any all that those bone problems, the liver problems, all those things you're associated with vitamin A toxicity are actually with the plant form supplement. Those are not with. Uh, there's the case. Plant there, form supplement. Yeah, that's the, that's what you're referring to. The uh, no vitamin A. So vitamin A supplements are either come in the form of fully formed retinol or they come in uh, just the carotenoid form. Uh, the carotenoid, the carotenoid far, form isn't dangerous because again, your body has to, uh, your body has to produce the fully formed vitamin A itself. My, my, uh, no, my point was form. that all those things are associated with <clears throat> high, high vitamin A supplementation. That was my point. Um, yeah, typically, uh, but most people aren't eating liver every single day. Yeah, so my, uh, con so my point is that any case there has never been a case of or any data showing that consumption of i mean and there's plenty of people on this diet that consume pounds and pounds of liver per day and they don't illustrate symptoms that these people do where okay, do you have any research take supplements. This, this is sounding like anecdotal claims yeah i have it right here um so i made a a post on I'm gonna link this to you I made a post on reddit uh, showing several hypervitaminosis a studies in people that took plant forms versus people that consumed carnivorous fish liver and when they consumed the carnivorous fish liver it was symptoms actually associated with heavy metal poisoning as opposed to uh, as opposed to the actual hypervitaminosis a and th there has been no research that I've been able to find that indicates that you can, uh, your body will not be able to regulate excess intake of vitamin A. But this isn't really, this isn't, I don't know how relevant this is just to my idea that a high vitamin A consumption through retinoic acid is beneficial for overall metabolic function. That would be more okay, difficult um, for me to prove outside of anecdotes. Like, I'm just quickly looking over the studies you linked me. Um, this is all with, uh, like, case reports where people were consuming uh, vitamin A supplement supplements. Uh, do you have, like, anything in the form of maybe, like, do you have case reports involving, like, just very high liver consumption or maybe, like, a randomized trial, ideally? The only thing in, in on the first part of that, the first link... Uh, let me just double check. The first, the first <laughs> link, the first link in that post is the carnivorous fish liver reports. That's all that's really there. Wait a second. What? Um, okay. The first link I saw was a pediatric case study where a child was just consuming a toxic amount of vitamin A through supplementation. Uh, let me just. You mean 23-month-old Chinese girl presented to the emergency room with vomiting, irritability. She consumed four pieces of fish liver the night before. That's not what you're looking at. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, okay. So th this is 
acute vitamin A toxicity from consuming fish liver. Well, we don't know if it's necessary because those are also symptoms that they uh, showed from uh, that you could get from copper toxicity as well. Uh, uh, her grandfather who ate the fish liver had similar symptoms. Yeah. Um, does, is fish high in copper? The pro uh, well, no, carnivorous fish liver is very high in heavy metals. And the point of, uh, car the point of this showing this study that ingesting carnivorous fish liver uh, is not a good idea is that carnivorous animals accumulate incredibly high amounts of vitamin A and copper and these metals in comparison to normal ruminants and normal livers that we would be eating more along the lines of dozens to hundreds of times higher. So by looking at this and what happens to these people that consume this carnivorous fish liver, if, if hypervitaminosis A was possible on a zero carb carnivore diet, we would see these symptoms in people more often. Okay. There's acute toxicity and there's chronic toxicity and they're both harmful. Um, but this seems like fish liver causes acute toxicity where it's much harder to do with something like beef liver. But you have people literally consuming on this diet. People, I've seen people eating half a pound to a pound of beef liver a day for months. Okay. And, and this, and there's no evidence that like, again, the um, these are anecdotal claims. I'd like to actually see a case report or something at the very least. I, I mean, I'm in the, I'm in the, you know, I, I'm in the same boat as you. I know the liver does regulate. I mean, you said earlier, the liver regulates your vitamin A intake, but uh, I mean, my, my own, I don't know why I went into this. The only real point I had was that there are benefits to consuming high vitamin A that many people see. And this is again, completely anecdotal. Uh, just because vitamin A in the form of retinoic acid is used in so many metabolic processes and the liver has uh, a version of it that's more available to the body. But to me, this wasn't really... Okay. Uh, uh, listen, this, this this like really ultimately comes down to overall health outcomes. Uh, do you have any evidence that consuming uh, vitamin A through carrots or sweet potatoes is less healthful than consuming it through something like liver, like beef liver? It's not necessarily that it's less healthful. It's just the bioavailability in a lot of contexts is questionable about how well, much we can actually- Well, bioavailability is like, it's a throwaway term. What matters is whether or not you're getting an adequate supply of vitamin A. There's no data showing that vegans have like higher rates of vitamin A deficiencies compared to meat eaters. And the point being, like, are you really telling me that sweet potatoes and carrots are, aren't as healthy as beef liver? Well, that's, that's a different, that's a very different question because beef liver is pretty much nutritionally complete, but- my, my the reason yeah, I didn't really want to complete you can have something that's nutritionally complete, but it's terrible for you. I didn't want to touch on that. I didn't really want to debate this. I just wanted to bring up the pos. It was more like bringing it up in possibility because I, I said earlier, it's very difficult because of the lack of data we have to talk about these things. I just wanted to bring them up as kind of an idea more as opposed to actually debating on whether or not it's necessary because I, I don't have an answer for that and you don't have an answer for that. Uh, well, yeah, I do. Uh, vitamin A prevalent, or sorry, prevalence of vitamin A deficiency isn't any higher among vegans, and things like carrots and sweet potatoes, they're protective against chronic disease, whereas something like beef liver liver is not. Well, I well then I I mean it, you I you could say that, but by answer I mean something based off of evidence. I could say something like, well, beef liver has a much higher retinoic acid content that is bioavailable to the body. So whether or not you're getting a questionable amount of vitamin A that's ideal for the body is out of the question. You're definitely getting plenty of vitamin A and then your body can deal with whatever excess you have. And I believe well, that that's important for being optimal in regards to <clears throat> metabolic function and health and that the RDAs for a lot of things are inaccurate and that most people would see a benefit from higher retinoic acid consumption. That is, would be my answer to that. Uh, and we and our answer well listen uh where's the evidence that high uh high vitamin a intake in the form of fully formed vitamin a uh, where's the evidence that it's beneficial i mean if you just i mean if you just want to talk about like what it does in the body there's i mean retinoic acid I, is... I know i know what it does in the body i'm just saying why is vitamin a intake that bypasses your own body's regulatory mechanisms why is eating a super high amount of it beneficial it, I mean, retinoic acid is still regulated. It still has to go through various forms before your body utilizes it. And the re the, the whole premise of this was <coughs> retinoic acid has a lot of functions in the human body. It's very, very important. And well, 
great, but the idea why, is it, is, why is it a good thing to eat a super high amount of it? Like it's bypassing your body's regulatory mechanisms. Again, no, normally, it's not because your yeah, body it, regulates retinoic acid. Well, it is. Um, again, you like you can suffer from acute and chronic toxicity from it. Like if you don't get chronic, if you don't get acute toxicity from vitamin A, you can also get cr like chronic toxicity where it causes uh, bone abnormalities. And chronic toxicity can occur at uh, intakes only two times the daily RDA recommended intake. So it's pretty low. Uh, again, like I, I'm not seeing any evidence that eating a super high amount of vitamin A uh, is at all beneficial. Like, like again, vegans don't have a higher prevalence of vitamin A deficiency. Uh, I don't see any evidence that a super high intake of vitamin A, where it's at the point of chronic toxicity, would be at all beneficial. And uh, again, like th these foods you're talking about, carrots and sweet potatoes are a lot more healthy and they protect against chronic disease, uh, whereas liver like causes chronic disease. As, as I said twice so far, these were things that I just wanted to bring up and speculate on the bioavailability of it and saying that, okay, if you eat liver, you're certainly getting enough of these vitamins, so there's nothing to be concerned about. This wasn't a, this wasn't a debate of whether or not it's important to get these super high levels of vitamin A because there there's, hasn't really been studies on that, and there's no way for me to prove outside of anecdotes that it's important to... Uh, okay, but, so, but it does not, retinol does not bypass regulation. It, it needs to go to retinol and then it needs to be oxidized to retinoic acid. It does not buy beta carotene. It's you consume, you consume the vitamin A from the food. It goes into retinol, then retinoic acid, then your body can utilize it. But carotenoids, it's, just, it's an extra step. It's not necessarily retinol, retinoic acid in the animal foods is not necessarily bypassing beta carotene requires an extra step. Well, it is. Again, if you're not suffering from acute toxicity, you can suffer from uh, chronic toxicity, and chronic toxicity occurs at only twice the RDA, recommended daily intake. Well, since I only have the anecdotes of myself eating up like two pounds of duck liver a day for a week, w let's let's try to well, put that on the back burner. You know what? Um, I'll link you this, uh, this paper, uh, The Acute and Chronic Toxic Effects of Vitamin A. I think you should actually read that uh, because... Chronic vitamin A toxicity is quite common. It happens at only twice the RDA intake. You can think you're you're completely fine, um, but this can cause problems like bone abnormalities uh, later in life. So uh, you should actually read that because you're like, I don't even know what you're trying to say here. Are you just trying to say, well, if you eat liver, you'll get enough vitamins? Like who cares? Uh, no, the, the overall idea b between bringing up this vitamin thing is that even in the context of people on the carnivore diet, uh, they would see a lot of benefits in energy and overall metabolic function from consuming a higher amount of vitamins in this bioavailable form. Now, the the thing is, I guess something else to bring up would be, okay, let's say you get your sweet potatoes and your coconut oil, and uh, theoretically you can metabolize it, but where in nature would we see these carotenoids where we can metabolize them in our digestive system in a natural way? Like, how would you actually... And I know this doesn't really apply because we have modern <clears throat> methods and modern science and supplements we can use to try to replicate this. But where in like a, a, a natural setting would we see the possibility of getting carotenoids in pres present with fat in, from a vegetable source that's available to pretty much all groups of people? Okay, well, Frank, you don't need to consume like an overt source of fat immediately when you eat uh, like pro-vitamin A carotenoids to convert carotenoids into vitamin a yeah but where would you be getting a non-animal source of fat as well as a large Nuts, amount of carotenoids and every you, you really don't need much fat to be able to absorb these fat soluble vitamins so you're telling me that someone is going to have and access grains. for a full for, the problem is well grains are out of the really kind of out of the picture because what do you mean out of the picture to to get the the fat content of a grain would would that even be the right it has to be saturated fat to my understanding to metabolize the no not oil. necessarily and like there is like there's a small amount of fat in in some grains too i know oh, i know that for sure and there but are nuts and but seeds but that's not like but, algae but it's but the the term i said accessible to all groups of people and that includes climate at various parts of the year so obviously things like nuts 
and grains and Frank, algae like, what not available to every like so, what mean, does this even matter vegans just, don't have a higher prevalence of vitamin a deficiency because the point was that you can't obtain vitamin a in nature at very in various Who different cares? locations and at various points of the year it's just something to okay. think about from Great. our because like, you're referencing and, well, Frank. Like, I mean, who cares if we can't get it in nature? Um, it's clearly ideal for health. Well, like I say, who cares about studies done on mummies four thousand years ago? Uh, because and those, it those shows people... that disease prevalent, like the prevalence of heart disease, has uh, like there's been a high prevalence of heart disease all throughout human history. But now, but now, when I say that, since we can't get carotenoids in a natural state and humans would have never obtained them from carotenoids and fat in this way then it just doesn't matter is that what you're saying no uh like again all i all, like all i really care about is reducing risk of chronic disease being healthier living longer why would i care if some like primitive proto-human couldn't get vitamin a from a carrot because all the indigenous because every indigenous group required vitamin a I mean, vitamin A was present in all of these diets. And in the case of like studies done on pigs, uh, if, if an animal is vitamin A deficient in birth, I mean, there's obvious vision problems. They're born without, uh, I, born I really without don't eyes. Uh, vitamin A deficiency They're... doesn't occur at a higher rate among vegans. No, but the point is that in nature, you would be vitamin, you wouldn't have enough vitamin A to survive on a vegan Great. diet. Uh, I don't care. And that's a dubious claim to begin with. Uh, so... So, I mean, for the most part, I do agree with you. I, do, I, I agree that vitamin D3 can be supplemented. I think that in the context of an optimal vegan diet, the vitamin A should not be a concern. Uh, in regards to the vitamin K2, I mean, that can be supplemented as well. And uh, what, what's the other um, one? Well, wait a second. Uh, are you claiming vegans don't get enough vitamin K2? I mean, uh, depending on the fermented food intake, uh, it varies between vegans. Okay, so uh, between fermented soybeans like natto, which actually has one of the highest amounts of vitamin K2 you can possibly get from any food, or like w what's high in K2, like grass-fed butter or something, or are, are you asking like what what's, K2 what's healthier in animal foods is? Oh, what or what like I would just yeah, bring it between, between natto, which is a source of K2, and between and something like uh, grass-fed butter or beef liver. What is a healthier source of K2? Well, both, well, there's, you know, there's a different MK change, like MK7, MK4, and natto is MK7, which needs to be converted to MK4. So uh, in, in liver, it it is, a, I mean, more available in that context, but the body can still convert it. The only reason I brought up the K2 thing was because it's just like the carotenoids, it's present in nature only in animal foods, whereas now we have modern versions of foods that we make that we never really saw before to obtain. The vitamin. Okay, um, vitamin K two is produced in your gut by your gut bacteria, uh, which is why it's it's virtually impossible to suffer uh, vitamin K deficiency as an adult. Um, and yeah, it, it is present in fermented foods like natto. So why would you eat something like beef liver or butter uh, rather than getting K two from natto if you're concerned about K two? Because you're isolating it. A f food that is very specific to one part of the world that is can be very inflammatory to some people and that some people are allergic to and cannot consume. And some people okay. don't even like it. Some, pe yeah, some, some people, people are, out. well, some people are allergic to soy and some people are also allergic to animal products. So what does that mean for like, I'm talking about the general population. Because overall, if, if you're saying, okay, Vitamin K2 is in literally a li like 20 animal products I can list versus only pretty much one source of a, that's a vegan source or it needs to be supplemented. You know, people would start to question about, you know, okay, if all of these vegan things I need to supplement or you take from a very specific, too. well, no, but if, if all these vegan things either need to be supplemented or neither either need to be obtained from a very specific food source that could not really be practical for all parts of the world and every person, how can you, it's hard to justify the nutrient availability and density of these people's diets. Well, I don't really care what people think is more convenient. I, I care about what's healthier. Um, why is it healthier? Well, well, if you even think this, uh, why is it healthier to consume K2 from something like liver or grass-fed butter as opposed to natto or take a supplement? 
Because you get the different MK chains. I mean, okay, um, Frank, that, that'd really be the, the only reason. Okay, Frank, um, the research on K2 is very mixed. Uh, positive findings have only come out of one single country. Mm -hmm. um, and the majority of research is showing that K2 intake is associated with a higher risk of heart disease. And that's because generally people are, people are getting their K2 from things like butter, liver, uh, terrible foods that increase risk of heart disease. Um, uh, I think, so, a, I mean, again, the, reason, the main reason I brought up K2 was because it's important for the calcium regulation in the body. And I, I know that a lot I, of I know people, that. And that's why I, I'm just saying so, this for the, the stream. I'm saying this because I think that a lot of people, especially on the standard American diet and the carnivore diet consume too much calcium without K2. And so that's just something I wanted to bring up, not necessarily okay, in the context well, of vegan versus animal. Well, Frank, so K2, uh, it's not picked up, it's not filtered out of your bloodstream like K1 is, and it bonds to a specific protein that carries calcium, and that's why uh, it's sometimes associated with a uh, lower risk of calcification in the arteries, uh, which is like a huge risk factor of like mm -hmm. mortality from heart disease. Uh, but the thing is, there have been mixed findings. Uh, mm -hmm. Positive findings have only come out of one country, I think it's the Netherlands, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, there are studies that have been conducted in Germany where K2 intake is associated with heart disease. And the reason for that is likely uh, because people are getting K2 from terrible sources like uh, beef liver, butter, uh, and these foods cause heart disease. So the, the take home message here is you should, have, you should look at the overall health effect of these foods and overall diet and not just focus on like these specific nutrients. Uh, so quality of food really matters here. If you want to get K2, then you should get it from natto or take a supplement. Um, like you're much better off uh, than eating something like butter, which has been proven to literally clog your arteries and kill you're, you. You're basing, you're basing everything you just said off of a study that you said was done in Germany, Germany showing that higher K2 does what? It, it increases well. risk of heart disease. But that's just, I, you're saying higher K2 increases risk of heart disease, but natto is much higher in K2 than any of those animal foods they would have likely been eating. It's literally 10 times higher. It's multiple times higher. Yeah. Way yeah. Higher. So why wouldn't you just eat like K2 from soybeans when the K2 is higher for one thing and fermented soybeans don't increase risk of heart disease, whereas things like butter do. But why would you say you should eat a food that has a hundred times the amount of K2 and then say that higher K2 is associated with heart disease. That just doesn't make no, sense. And then no, try no, to relate no. it. But look, you, you can't say that me. and then relate it. To you're, mis you're misunderstanding no, I'm not. You're misunder I, don't, I understand what you said. No, you said it was the food me, they were eating. Let me clarify. Let me clarify for you. It was because of their diet and the foods they were eating, right? That's what well, you said. Well, let me, let me well, clarify. Well, the K2. Well, let me clarify for you. Um, K, like The majority of the time people are getting their K2 from animal products, like butter, uh, certain cheeses, uh, like liver, shit like that. So when you do a population study on K2 intake, you what you're really study? doing... I'm sorry, did you sorry? Have that? Can you link um, me that study? I'll actually sure. link you... A Let me see if I can article. Google it. Well, I can link you a big article on, uh, on vitamin K, and the research links are in that article. But um, positive findings have only been coming out of one country. There might be like multiple like confounding factors and reasons for that, but... Research in other countries uh, has shown K2 intake is associated with an increased risk of heart disease. And that's likely because they're eating more foods that cause heart disease, like butter, like liver, uh, garbage like that. So uh, K2 intake, like among the general population uh, with like these common foods like butter, cheese, liver, uh, it is associated with, with heart disease in uh, research coming out of every other country, uh, but like the mechanistic data suggests that K2 is protective against heart disease. So again, the take home message here is that uh, you should get K2 from good quality plant sources. Well, like I'm sorry, what was the, uh, what was the, you said, do you know what country the study, the K2 I was in was where they said it was beneficial? No, I country. believe it was the Netherlands. Um, okay, so I'm looking at a study right now that says uh, a problem with K2 can be interactions with various medications. Like it, okay. it has, it, because vitamin K2 is essentially an anticoagulant. So we would assume that if a country has is more has higher you know rates of taking certain medications, that if they have a that vitamin K2 intake would be associated inversely. So I think that's a pretty good explanation for so, why we might see so, problems with vitamin K2. 
So wait, um, how does it interact with a medication where it would increase risk of uh, like death from a heart attack? Well, that's the no, no. But vi vitamin K two, sounds... vitamin K two works as an anticoagulant, and and it's right, very so... important for blood health. But the there are medications that uh, kind of work against. I mean, I can't, I'm listen, man. I'm not a biochemist. I can't explain that specifically. Right. That was well, a study that, I looked up. That makes sense, but again, um. Like this just shows more than anything that you shouldn't really, you should be careful with supplementing K2 or even intaking K2 from any source. Um, so this isn't really a good argument for eating animal products. No, but that could be an explanation of why, right. most okay. people, that, why there was an association with the K2 and mm -hmm. the increased uh, mortality. Right, whatever. but given how given how the data is currently mixed and these foods like butter, cheese, liver, they're high in saturated fat, cholesterol, and heme iron, uh, they've been proven to increase risk of heart disease. Why would you eat those sources of K2 when you can get something like natto, which has way more K2, and it's not associated with chronic but, disease? But, it, but, but then we have to just move on from K2 because you're saying other things are causing the problem. What do you mean? If you're saying saturated fat, cholesterol, and all the other, and heme iron, and all the negative things in the animal foods are the reason, then we should just move on and discuss those individually, okay. as opposed to focusing okay, on K2. Sure. I'd love to. But um, uh, I guess I could just mention, I mean, there are plenty of other vitamins that are, uh, and those, the other vitamins outside of A in the form of retinoic acid, uh, D3 can be supplemented or obtained from animal foods, and K2 can be obtained from, as you said, the natto, and then animal foods. The All the other vitamins are present in both plant and animal foods the and that, so the problem here frank is you can look at like mechanistic data and shit all you want um what ultimately matters is health outcomes in a population um if you're going to claim that vitamin like pro vitamin a carotenoids aren't uh like they're not changed into fully formed vitamin a uh converted in your body very efficiently like okay well what are the health outcomes of that like you haven't shown anything that like you haven't shown any evidence that vegans have higher rates of deficiencies in these sorts of things uh, if it's a direct result of their diet and uh, if it's actually caused a significant overall impact to their health. Like do vegans have a higher risk of a particular disease because they're not getting enough of a certain vitamin? No, I mean, the only thing I have to say in regards to the vitamin A benefits would be anecdotes that I personally have and you don't want to hear those. No, right. like I okay. like at the very, very bare minimum, I'd want to see case reports, uh, but you know, preferably things like randomized trials. Okay, so did you want to discuss saturated fat and cholesterol and its relation uh, relationship with heart disease? Because I have seen a few videos on your channel where you were claiming saturated fat and cholesterol do not cause heart disease. I mean, we could. I mean, the problem I have is there hasn't, you know. We're, we're debating back and forth on all these different things. But when we actually go to look at the physical studies, you know, they're done on people you know, on standard American diets and, and uh, no, much not all of them. Um, what's well, you actually believe that saturated fat and cholesterol do not cause heart disease, correct? I mean, like, or can you, you like, do you mean if if I eat saturated fat and cholesterol, in in human amounts for the next 80 years do you do i think i'm going to drop dead of a heart attack is that the question kind of well no i'm saying do you believe that saturated fat and cholesterol have nothing to do with heart disease risk no i mean there's obvious associations that have been proven with that but those um then you have to kind of just go into that inflammation insulin resistance and all of those things can that cause well, the inflammation of the body well, saturated fat is pro-inflammatory, and it does cause insulin resistance. I, uh, and then, iron, well, and, and using using saturated fat oh. as a blanket term for monounsaturated fat, <clears throat> polyunsaturated fat, all those the aren't different. saturated fats. Uh, no, but like, when, no, but when you look at when you look at any food that contains saturated fat, it also can. It's not just going to be, for, at least for the most part, foods that people are eating, just saturated fat and you have to look at the context of what other fats and oils they're eating in their diet that cause inflammation it's not as much as you're saying saturated fat as a blanket term no one only eats saturated fat that's not how it works even saturated fat yeah. in, the, in animal foods is has monounsaturated fat polyunsaturated. it has a bunch of fat and vitamins and things that you can't just use a blanket term to describe 
a substance like saturated fat. It doesn't make sense to me. Okay. Um, saturated fats uh, do activate certain pro-inflammatory genes. Uh, they do alter the gut bacteria to be pro-inflammatory. And you can even see an immune response from saturated fat. So uh, during consumption of saturated fat, you see greater monocyte adhesion, which is uh, the immune cells in your body. Uh, but when you consume omega-3s, you don't see that immune response. So saturated fats definitely are pro-inflammatory. And um, they also uh, break down into non-esterified fatty acids, which are toxic to insulin producing beta cells in your, in your pancreas, uh, which causes diabetes. So, you're, you're, um, but you're, you're taking you're taking one part, one aspect of a food out of the context of all the other beneficial things that, like monounsaturated, fat, monounsaturated fat, polyunsaturated fat, well, various we're not vitamins. Talking about mono and polyunsaturated fats. We're talking about saturated fat. Yeah, but my point is that you can't talk about saturated fat without mentioning those other things. It just doesn't make any sense. Well, no, you can, and we can talk about those other things and how they modulate heart disease risk. But saturated fats are in fact pro-inflammatory. They activate immune responses, like they increase monocyte adhesion. And uh, they produce toxic breakdown products, which kill insulin-producing beta cells in your, in your pancreas, uh, which, uh, especially among genetically predisposed individuals, it'll result in type 2 diabetes. But this is like what they did with the, what was it, the hydrocarbons and the rats where they took like 10,000 times the amount. They isolated a substance that occurs in a natural food. No, no, no. I'm talking about humans. Yeah, but, this but is, if this you're is all research in humans, if you're consuming, what I wanted to get at was if you're consuming saturated fat uh, from healthy food sources that I would consider healthy, like, like wild what? wild game, wild caught fish, things like that, it's present with a lot of other vitamins, beneficial fats. That that's okay, the reason well, you eat those well, foods. Well, Frank, um, let like let's talk about some of these these confounding factors here. So are you telling me that if you eat uh, saturated fat from wild caught game like a deer, that fat is not going to break down into toxic breakdown products known as non-esterified free fatty acids and kill insulin producing beta cells in your pancreas? How is that saturated fat any different than saturated fat in a piece of beef? Well, that's actually a tough question to answer because I think deer fat would actually be only mono and polyunsaturated fat. Uh, uh, no, it, it would have saturated fat. It's a leaner type of meat. Uh, it would have less of it than like, you know, grain fed beef cattle, but uh, it's going to have saturated fat in it. So what's the, so the basis of you just isolating, I mean, this isn't really something I honestly, because for me, the whole, the whole saturated fat, cholesterol, blah, 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 all that arguing stuff has been done a hundred times. Like, okay, well, Frank, do you, like, I, I just want to know, do you actually believe that saturated fat and cholesterol do not contribute to heart disease risk? If you're talking about heart disease risk in the context of studies, I already answered your question. There are plenty it, of studies well, that do, show, there are plenty no, of studies it, that it's show. It's a yes or no question. It's a yes or no question. Do you believe saturated fat and cholesterol increases risk of heart disease? I can say yes in the context of studies people that have higher saturated fat and cholesterol intake in certain studies have been shown to have higher risk of heart disease. But as I said, all of these things that I'm talking about, saturated fat in the context of what foods you're eating, other factors in the person's diet, what other foods they're eating, you can't just isolate. I could probably isolate uh, some obscure consumption. What, what, what could I say? Maybe I could say, um, I don't know. What's a good example? Maybe I, I find a, a group of people that really like eating popcorn and I start showing that, okay, popcorn increases risk. People that consume popcorn have a higher risk for heart disease, but you, you have to consider other lifestyle factors, other things they're eating, other things they're doing in my, their life that are associated with people that tend to consume <coughs> higher amounts of saturated fat, especially in the context that, you know, the majority of people are like, if you walked up to someone on the street, they would probably agree that fat is not they would probably think that fat is not good for you. You have to take those other things into consideration as opposed to just isolating uh, a specific thing. Okay, Frank, you're talking about confounding factors, and that is a reasonable concern when you're doing epidemiological research, but there's enough mechanistic data proving that saturated fat does increase risk of heart disease uh, due to increasing serum cholesterol levels. Uh, and you yourself, you picked out the Maasai uh, of Africa 
as people following an ideal sort of diet, uh, they have extraordinarily high uh, prevalence of heart disease. You've even admitted this yourself and linked me research showing that. So, um, like, I, I don't even know what you're really trying to argue here. Like, does saturated fat increase heart disease risk or not? You didn't really answer my question. Uh, the saturated fat increase heart disease risk? Uh, I mean, in the context of the studies you're talking about, that's a that's not no, as I said. Like, like, I'm not. There's there's enough mechanistic data. Um, saturated fat does in fact raise serum cholesterol, and serum cholesterol is the main risk factor for heart disease. It, do you believe? Okay, that so to I, be true I mean, I could. I mean, the problem is there are studies that show saturated fat. There, there's as I said, there's studies on both sides of the table. There's studies that show saturated fat has no link between very LDL, and there's studies that show it does. There's studies that show dietary cholesterol <clears throat> increases. There's studies that there's studies on both sides of the coin. So well, I don't really no, want to beat okay. this to death because this okay, could be another. So this is important uh, because you don't seem to under be able to understand uh, what research is credible or not. So uh, the study showing that there's no link between saturated fat and cholesterol intake and heart disease risk. Uh, they're typically prospective uh, epidemiological studies where they don't take baseline cholesterol into account. So um, there's two issues. Um, ba like if you have a baseline cholesterol intake of zero, uh, the any added dietary cholesterol will have a very significant impact on your serum cholesterol score. So say if you're vegan and you decide to eat an egg every day, your cholesterol will increase by uh, roughly 10 to 15%. But if you're eating like a, a standard American diet where you're consuming roughly 400, 500 milligrams of cholesterol per day, if you add an egg to your diet, uh, there will be little to no change in your cholesterol score. You know, so you know the whole reason, well, listen, I really just don't I'm like not, talking about this. I'm whole. not done. I'm not done. Listen, so your body has a regulatory mechanism with, with cholesterol and a lot of the research showing that, oh, well, higher intakes of cholesterol don't associate with higher incidence of disease. It's just because they're not taking baseline cholesterol intake into account. If you compare a cohort of vegans to meat eaters, the vegans ob like obviously will have lower rates of heart disease because they have lower intakes of saturated fat, they eat no cholesterol, and thus their serum cholesterol score is much lower. And that's why in the Adventist co cohorts, vegans had, what, a 55% reduced risk of uh, ischemic heart disease? So uh, you're just referencing uh, bad data here. Uh, I don't think I reference anything. Uh, I, my, well, my whole seen, thing I've with videos. Videos. Well, my, whole, listen, my listen. whole problem with this whole cholesterol versus saturated fat thing is it, you, you're coming into this discussion with the acceptance that, you know, saturated fat and cholesterol are bad for you when that original, yeah. that original hypothesis traces back to them injecting rabbits with whatever they gave saturated fat to rabbits that have there's an obvious reason you, you shouldn't be given saturated fat to rabbits. It's not, they don't. Okay, uh, Frank, we've, the Frank, whole there's been more of, research on heart disease than animal experiments conducted 100 years ago on rabbits. You understand that, right? But my point is that the whole premise of everything you're talking about right now is based on conventional wisdom, everything no, it's not, that no, it's people not. It's based on metabolic granted. word experiments. No, it's based on metabolic word experiments. And that we're actual, trying to prove that saturated fat and cholesterol. This is not a discussion I'm having in a short span of time without looking at data and research. I'm not doing this without like I have some stuff in front of me. I have some things in front of me, but I'm not, this has been beaten to <clears> death. <throat> and whether you're a vegan or a carnivore, you're going to look at the research that, that fits your, whatever you want to believe in. And you're going to try to discredit the other person's research and say what they're doing is wrong. I don't well, th think Frank, the saturated fat and cholesterol thing needs to be beaten to death anymore. Well, Frank, uh, that's complete nonsense. Look, I've seen uh, a few of your videos and I, I saw a video you made specifically about saturated fat, cholesterol and heart disease. You referenced articles made by uh, Chris Kresser. I, I, I don't know why you'd reference articles made by just a random person who just has a degree in acupuncture and Chinese medicine. Uh, the research you're looking at is flawed by design. They're pretty much all prospective studies where they didn't take baseline cholesterol intake into account. Um, there's enough individual variation 
in uh, baseline cholesterol itself. So if two people were eating the exact same diet, they'd have different cholesterol scores. And if you don't take baseline cholesterol into account, then you're going to end up with uh, a data set that doesn't show any association between uh, something like saturated fat and heart disease because saturated fat intake doesn't usually correlate with uh, serum cholesterol just because of the wide difference of individual variation in serum cholesterol. So uh, that's, so uh, again, if you look at things like randomized trials, dietary change experiments, metabolic ward experiments, um, reducing saturated fat and cholesterol is associated with lower, lower serum cholesterol. And uh, typically you see a reduction in heart disease risk. And again, I, that's why. I, I, as I said, I don't want to beat this to death. There are studies that show that having high cholesterol is associated with lower mortality. And there are studies showing that no, low there cholesterol. Isn't. No, there isn't. Um, uh, no, there isn't. No, no, there, there aren't. What they show is reverse causation. Um, if you take it, it's especially prevalent with elderly populations. But when elderly people get sick, so let's say they get cancer, uh, they get the flu, uh, their just general health is declining. Typically, that lowers their cholesterol, uh, either from a direct result of the disease, medications they're taking, or from confounding factors, like you're not feeling well, you're not gonna eat as much, your cholesterol goes down. Uh, and just them being sick lowers their cholesterol. So it's not the, the low cholesterol causing disease, it's the disease causing low cholesterol. So uh, again, this is just reverse causation. I should have um, asked, I should have asked this sooner. You're the, the point. What is the just the overall premise? Like that saturated fat in the diet increases cholesterol. Is and yeah, then so saturate both saturated fat and cholesterol in the diet increases serum cholesterol, and serum cholesterol is the principal risk factor in heart disease. Okay, but if we say we can't really say that when you know, lipid panel is, gets much more complex than that. And honestly, above my, no, it, it really doesn't. We no, know I, that, I, we know look, that I, HDL to LDL, LDL particle count, C-reactive protein, no, 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 we know no, all no, of those no, things no. are Frank, much more significant in indicating no, no, inflammation. No, 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 no. In Frank, I, I've heard this argument before. You've probably listened to Peter Atia a little too much. Uh, he used to be a doctor. <clears throat> what Peter Atia does is he cherry picks research on uh, overweight people with diabetes. And what they found is with overweight people with diabetes, uh, different biomarkers are uh, a, a little more accurate for determining heart disease risk, like LDLP, C-reactive protein, ApoB. Um, in the general population, LDLC is the, is the most significant risk factor for heart disease. Uh, with diabetics, uh, you know, the biomarkers are a bit different because it creates a different lipid profile. But uh, among the general population, LDLC is the most important risk factor for heart disease. That's what I'm saying. LDL, that's why you can't just say cholesterol as a blanket term. That well, doesn't make no, sense. No. Frank, among the general population, LDLC is the most important risk factor for heart disease. Now, among overweight diabetics, it changes a bit, but still, um, that doesn't change the fact that LDLC is harmful. This is, as I said, has been argued back and forth. There's probably a hundred people you can have on here that can discuss cholesterol and argue cholesterol. And I, I don't know how many times yeah, I've they said, don't what, know what they're is, talking about. But you, you're just you're disagreeing with anything that goes. Just you will disagree with any. And what I just said, you you agreed with is that. There's other factors outside of just total cholesterol that affect your your cardiovascular risk. That's not it's it's this well, is much more yes, complicated than what you're saying. Well, and then, no, 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 Frank. I, I'm not like trying to reduce this down to be as simple as possible. The biggest risk factor among the general population is LDLC. That doesn't mean things like LDLP, ApoB, C reactive protein don't play a role, but LDLC is the most significant. Um, and among diabetics, things change a bit. Other biomarkers are a little more relevant, but that doesn't mean LDLC doesn't still play a risk factor, uh, like a risk factor here. Well, if you want to discuss this, when let just look at cholesterol in general and the function that actually causes heart disease is primarily because of inflammation and oxidized fats. Correct. Okay. Well, dietary cholesterol increases the susceptibility of serum cholesterol to oxidation. And a lot of the foods you're eating, like uh, foods that are high in saturated fat, uh, high in heme iron, like red meat, they're pro-oxidants. 
So they increase. So you're eating foods that increase LDL to oxi like increase the susceptibility of LDL to oxidation, and you're eating foods that cause oxidation. So any food, an oxidized fat, a rancid fat, an inflammatory fat is not a an animal fat. That is not what we're talking about. I no, don't understand. no, Frank, you're not understanding me. Um, eat, eating dietary cholesterol increases your serum cholesterol, uh, like increases the susceptibility to oxidative modification. Also, the foods you're eating that include heme iron, like red meat and steak, uh, heme iron is a pro-oxidant. So again, you're increasing the susceptibility of your LDL to oxidation, and you're eating pro-oxidant foods. So you are not only increasing your serum cholesterol, but you're also increasing the amount of oxidized uh, LDL particles in your circulation. No, but when, but when you're not consuming oxidized fats or, in, or inflammatory foods in general, that has that does not matter. Okay, so how is heme iron not inflammatory? Heme iron is inflammatory in the context that most people consume it in because it's absent of other vitamins and things that are required to metabolize it. Uh, let me just go look at the, I did a video on this well, like two weeks ago. <clears throat> uh, Frank, how does heme iron become non-inflammatory non and not a pro-oxidant? It doesn't, but the, the rate you consume it at and the foods you consume it with affect its digestibility, how it's absorbed in the body. Uh, you need multiple vitamins and other minerals to absorb iron in the body. Well, no, not for heme iron. It bypasses your regulatory mechanisms. Uh, normal iron from plant foods, uh, that is true, but heme iron just bypasses your regulatory mechanisms. Uh, and again, heme iron is a pro-oxidant. So uh, you're talking about like oxidized LDL particles as being harmful uh, because they're pro-inflammatory. Well, you're eating foods that increase the susceptibility of LDL to oxidation and you're eating pro-oxidants that actually oxidize you see, your LDL. You see, products. the problem is with what you did with the saturated fat, you're isolating a food outside of the context that it would normally be consumed in. Okay, uh, uh, Frank, tell me, tell me, well, like how does eating something that's grass-fed or free range or whatever, how does that change the fact that heme iron is a pro-oxidant? Let me let me just look at my studies that I have from my video last week because this was not an easy explanation after doing it a few hours of research, let alone off the top of my head. So, uh, Frank, heme iron itself is very closely linked with heart disease, diabetes, and certain forms of cancer. Um, there's a meta-analysis titled, Is Heme Iron Intake Associated with Risk of Coronary Heart Disease? A Meta-Analysis of Prospective Studies. Uh, what they found was per milligram intake of heme iron per day, it was associated with uh, almost a 30% increase in heart disease risk. Uh, I think they they ended up with one milligram per day was associated with a 27% increased risk of heart disease. So one milligram. Uh, how many milligrams of heme iron are you intaking per day? One second. I'm... As I said earlier, I'm not comfortable discussing these things or with you having uh, – because I have studies that I looked up about all of these things from heme iron to cholesterol to whatever it is. But if I'm not making statements on on heme iron or, or saturated fat or any of these things <laughs> without having the data off okay, the well, top of my you head. You knew you were going to get into a, a debate today, so why wouldn't you have prepared some research uh, surrounding the relevant topics? I did, but you don't seem to take my answers of you isolating these things outside of the context of how they should be consumed as okay, well, a reasonable discussion. Well, Frank, how does like how does heme iron not become a pro-oxidant when the animal eats grass? Because it's not about heme iron itself. It's about the context of the person's diet and if they have the required you're, vitamins and minerals to metabolize iron properly so Frank, it does not stay in the digestive tract. Frank, you're talking about confounding factors. Uh, heme iron is a pro-oxidant. No matter what you consume it with, 
if you consume it with anti-inflammatory foods, yes, it offsets the anti-inflammatory pro-oxidant properties of heme iron, but heme iron is still a pro-oxidant. So why would you consume it at all? But, What's the but this, what is so important about this one? Don't vegans usually have higher blood levels of no iron um, in general? No, I don't believe so. Uh, they they don't have a higher prevalence of iron deficiency. Um, and like Frank, what's the benefit of consuming heme iron when it's a pro-oxidant and it's linked with uh, heart disease, diabetes, and certain forms of cancer? Because you don't seem to understand that my point is you need to consume these foods in the context of overall nutrient density. And if you isolate any compounds in a food, you can make an argument for why it would be bad for your health. No, not really. Uh, like, again, Frank, like nothing you're saying here is, is at all consistent or makes sense. Like, first you were claiming that like hunter-gatherer populations, they don't have chronic disease. And then you link me, the Maasai, who you claim have an ideal diet, extraordinarily high rates of heart disease. It's just that their, their rates of mortality from heart disease uh, are low compared to uh, standard Americans. Um, so, like, again, why would you consume heme iron? I, I just don't understand. Like, you can consume lentils, you can eat high vitamin C fruits and vegetables that aid with iron absorption, and then you'll get enough iron, you don't get any of the pro-oxidant effects, and things like lentils, beans, peas, uh, they're associated with longer life expectancy. So why would you eat, like, a carnivore diet or eat, like, the Maasai when, you know, there's a better way of doing things? If you want an answer on this heme iron thing specifically, give me two minutes or well, maybe a little more. Okay, sure. Minutes. So what, what, what the base is that uh, heme iron is oxidizing, whereas non-heme iron isn't? Uh, is, that the, well, is that the main concern about it? Or is it, is it also about the concern about just the, he, the heme iron association with various diseases. Well, heme iron is a pro-oxidant and it's associated with increased risk of heart disease, diabetes, and certain forms of cancer, whereas non-heme isn't. Thank you. What is your, um, what, what is your, which part of the, are you just talking about like the interaction of heme iron in the large intestine with other? Well, no, I wasn't even talking about like. Oh, you're just talking, talking about why it's inflammatory. Digestion. You're talking about why it's inflammatory, right? Yeah, it's pro-oxidant. Yeah, but that, that oxidation occurs in, and that inflammation occurs in the large intestine. Okay. And that's because of its interaction. And this is what, this is the study I did on my video a couple weeks ago. It's because of its interaction with and nitroso compounds and like cured meats and stuff. It's not necessarily to do with heme iron in itself. Heme so iron uh, produces the endogenous production of N nitroso compounds. When inter interacting with, let me, let me look at the study to read the exact, um, exact context. Well, Frank, this isn't exactly relevant to what I'm saying. Uh, heme iron, it is because you're just isolating a food and saying it causes oxidation when the real the reason it's causing oxidation is because it's an absence of other vitamins and minerals and because it's interacting with specific negative things what that are in these natural foods. If you look up iron metabolism, well, what vitamins and minerals? Uh, like what food that contains heme iron uh, is not going to have these pro-oxidant effects? What do you mean, like, like what food, like, does the food have, what's the question, like, what vitamins do you need but, to absorb iron, or what? No, like, I, I'm asking, like, you're claiming that, oh, well, the only reason they find an association between heme iron intake and risk of heart disease is because they're not consuming it with some other vitamins or minerals, or it's not the right type of grass-fed whatever. Um, what food that contains heme iron uh, doesn't have these pro-oxidant effects? Oh, I mean, like cured meat, sausages, and just in general, the way we're raising our animals now, especially like chicken and pork and stuff, it just has incredibly high levels of, well, not necessarily incredibly high, but it has normal levels of heme iron, but it doesn't have any of the other vitamins or minerals or anything present necessarily to uh, metabolize the iron. 
Okay, well, no, this this occurs with fresh meat. But your so, but fresh meat does not have if you, all you consume is fresh meat, it doesn't have vitamin A, it doesn't have large amounts of the other minerals like copper and zinc and things that you need in balance with iron to at least enough amounts of these other vitamins to you know the animal has to be consumed in the context of like no to tail eating uh in order to you know like i think something like blood sausage or, or just pretty much what like what you said earlier the skeletal muscle it's consuming large amounts of skeletal muscle okay, to my uh, understanding especially in the context of a standard american diet would just cause cause in natural amounts of heme iron to be in the blood as opposed to uh having the adequate other things that would normally be consumed with that much heme iron. Okay, Frank, it sounds like you're doing this thing where you move the goalposts further and further back. Um, I have this sort of issue all the time with people who promote keto or carnivore or whatever. Um, when I link data showing, okay, well, intake of this nutrient is associated with increased disease. Well, they say, oh, well, it's not grass fed, free range, organic, whatever meat there that you're, you're supposed to be consuming. Well, Frank, the fact is, uh, there's mechanistic data proving that heme iron is a pro-oxidant. It, it causes the production of nitroso compounds endogenously within the body. And according to epidemiological research, uh, it's very strongly linked with heart disease, diabetes, cancer. Like, you can make these claims all you want. Well, heme iron isn't as bad when you're eating it with organs and the animal's free-range grass-fed and it's wild or something. Well, that literally doesn't matter. Uh, heme iron isn't good for you, period. Uh, you're just adding in a list of confounding factors that may modulate its risk, but heme iron is still bad for you. Like, why would you consume any amount of heme iron? Uh, I don't think I answered anything yet. I'm still trying to look through my studies for the, the specific reference I have. Uh, so... The point that as I, and you're talking about N nitroso compounds, but those N nitroso compounds that you're referring to have nothing to do with heme iron. They have to do with the oxidation of heme iron. What my point was earlier was that these people are consuming these cured and processed meats that have nitrates and they're using a direct fire drying process, which forms those compounds. And then heme iron interacts with these compounds that are a result of the nitrates in the food that cause high levels of inflammation. And that's, that's the main reason, uh, the main reason that there's a very high colorectal cancer risk with uh, heme iron and nitrate cured foods. Okay. Um, I, I'm still not hearing a reason why heme iron in particular is totally safe to eat. I mean, you, you, like don't again, you, you, you don't, you don't have a, don't, the reason that heme iron would be bad for you is because of its interaction with those cured meats and those compounds and those cured meats. That's the reason it could be bad for you. There's um, no, I'd, we, I'd imagine it's worse because of those factors you mentioned, but heme iron itself is a pro oxidant. So like, again, you're just adding on confounding factors like, okay, yeah, if it's cured, if it's like treated at high heat, it makes it worse. But I, I'm not hearing an argument for why. What, what, is your, is I, what, is, what are you saying? Like, Heme iron is a pro oxidant, but right? you're just saying that it's associated with in inflammation because of other things. It is not specifically an oxidant. Notice, uh, notice uh, again, like even with uh, the supplement form, uh, it's associated with increased risk of, of heart disease. And for the same reason. Because you're consuming it outside of the context of the amount you're supposed to consume it in and you're having how the only you, okay. the interaction you're referencing the interaction you're referencing with oxidizing iron is because of those those problems with the nitrates and the curing process of foods it has nothing to do with iron in itself okay so you're saying heme iron is not a pro oxidant when you're eating fresh forms of meat but you you no i'm saying that you, the re, i'm saying that heme iron is detrimental in the context of n nitroso compounds and cured meats and so, right. So you're saying it doesn't act as a pro oxidant when it's consumed in fresh meats, but what is the, what is the, what is it doing in the human body? That's you would consider damaging in the context of just iron well, itself. It's it doesn't oxidizing do LDL particles.
and oxidized LDL particles are more atherogenic. That's why there's a strong but, association but, but with heart disease. Iron doesn't cause... That has nothing to do with the oxidation of LDL particles. That has nothing to do with it. What are you talking about? Dude, you could literally... Oxidization, oxidation of LDL, their results of not having normal metabolism, diseases, toxins, any things like that. If you're, you're saying that iron, when consumed in excess, specifically causes no, this. No, um, not in excess. Uh, per milligram intake of heme iron, it's associated with uh, about a 27% increased risk of heart disease. So that's not in excess. That just means replacing... Uh, like normal plant sources of iron with heme iron. You're just you're changing this from initially. You were saying heme iron causes whatever oxid. Uh, your defi your definition of I said oxidation. It's, a oxidant. it's not so that it causes the oxidation of LDL particles in your serum in your blood and oxidized has, LDL. Iron iron has nothing not to do with that. Iron has nothing to do with that. That's just okay. That's so inflammation how, caused by so, free radicals and things like that. That has nothing to do with iron. Um, I, I don't even understand what you're arguing at this point. My understanding of heme iron going into this was that you were going to reference the N-nitroso compounds and, and go into that. And that's because that is the only thing to my knowledge that heme iron is associated negatively with anything else you're saying. I have literally never heard of or have never done any research on. I don't know why you're dwelling okay. on this point. Because there's nothing that you can, I don't know well, if you're referencing that you could show me that iron does these things, but I, I've been okay, looking, well, I've been looking up everything you've been saying for the past 10 minutes. And I, I really got nothing to be honest outside of the initial heme iron versus nitroso compound stuff. Okay. Well, the research I just linked to you, the meta-analysis is heme iron intake associated with risk of coronary heart disease and meta-analysis of prospective studies. Um, heme iron may contribute to the development of atherosclerosis by catalyzing the production of hydroxyl free radicals and promoting low density lipoprotein oxidation. So, uh, again, heme iron itself is a pro-oxidant and it oxidizes LDL in the serum and that's why it increases heart disease risk. Um, it's also associated with increased risk of diabetes and cancer. For, what did, what did uh, you, what did you just read? The, um... Are you reading the results? I think that was the last study I linked, and it was just the first part of the extra, uh, abstract. So, uh, like, Frank, uh, according to the data I've seen, uh, heme, heme iron... Hold on, hold on. Can I just reread this, please? Yeah. Uh, heme iron can contribute to the development of atherosclerosis by catalyzing production of hydroxyl-free radicals and promoting low-density lipoprotein oxidation. So, catalyzing production of hydroxyl-free radicals is what you're saying it's doing not you're saying it's by doing that it's promoting oxidation right sorry you're saying what you're saying is not that heme iron you're saying heme iron promotes oxidation because it catalyzes production of hydroxyl free radicals that's yeah. what the study says okay so give me like two minutes because i'm not a biochemist You don't have the uh, full study here, do you? Because that would help. Uh, no, it's the full text isn't available. <sighs> da, da, da. Okay, well, Frank, anyways. Um, okay, well, either way, the problem with this study is the uh, relative risk factor is 1.27. So you might as well just throw this study out the window, man. <laughs> like, this doesn't matter. Increased risk. One point, if, if, a study, if a study has any... If a study is like, it needs to be at least over two. Like most people would just throw no, this. No, it comment. doesn't. Yes, it does. N this no, is like, I, I don't is, think you understand what a hazard ratio is. This is insignificant in the context. Of, this is like any, no, anyone not. who understands relative risk would just dismiss this study. I'm uh, not talking. So I wish 30, you liked this earlier because so I wouldn't have A 30% have increased risk per milligram of heme iron intake is insignificant? This is... Yeah, it is insignificant in the context okay, of research. Okay, so if we so if I consumed three milligrams of heme iron, that would increase my risk by like a hazard ratio of two point oh, so uh, like a hundred percent essentially, double the risk. I just wish you know, 
even if I did want to entertain the idea that this dog shit study was admissible with this risk factor, I just don't have the full text and I'm trying to find it. Okay, um, Frank, anyways, uh, according to the research I've seen, uh, heme iron is a pro-oxidant and but, it is associated with increased risk of no, chronic but, disease. No, but you're just, see, the thing is you're, you you're were, just linking now, listen, studies listen, 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 and you're not listen. showing metabolic process. You're not showing. Now, okay, 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 that's fine. But I'd like to see some conflicting information from you because so far all you've said is like grass fed though, essentially. No, that's, I haven't said anything, actually. I, all I said was that heme iron in the context of N-nitroso compounds is probably the highest okay. known I, negative thing associated with heme iron. I can agree that processed meat is worse than, you know, fresh meat, but I'd like to see actual data uh, suggesting that heme iron from fresh meat isn't harmful. And you can link me laboratory data, mechanistic data, population data. I don't care. I just like to see conflicting information here. So what I'm thinking right now is the information you're presenting in regards to the dangers of heme iron you have it not proven to me that heme iron is damaging outside of the N nitro. So you, you can't, outside of the interactions with the nitrates, there's nothing to me that indicates heme iron is detrimental. So with a basis of, we don't really know, you just want me to try to prove that it's beneficial? Well, Frank, uh, according to the data that I've presented to you, heme iron intake increases risk of atherosclerosis. And it that, does that. that data, that study is complete dog shit. And if you want to dwell on that, I will try to find the full. Okay. Study. Uh, it's not just a study. It's a meta analysis. The uh, so you know, it's not exactly risk, just risk bullshit. Ratio, the risk ratio for this is too low. It's way How, too low. So per milligram. Uh, so if I, if the study did per three milligrams of heme iron intake, it increased the risk of a heart disease by a hundred percent. That would I, I'm not getting this. It's like you don't understand that this is per milligram of heme iron. So if you consumed three milligrams of heme iron, according to the study, you you double your risk of heart disease. And, and this is a meta-analysis, by the way. It's not just a single study. You see, every study you've linked me today, unfortunately, does not have any text and there's no, yes, basis. there's no basis. There's unfortunately, no, the full text isn't available. Th there's no basis because my problem is there's no basis for this besides this study, and you can't physically explain to me it's what it's not just this a study. It's a meta analysis. You're, you're, both of us are unable to explain what heme iron physically does in the body outside of my explanation for its interaction with N nitroso compounds. Okay, well, Frank, despite that, the epidemiological research clearly shows heme iron intake increases risk of heart disease. Now, you can say the only reason for that is because of uh, consumption of processed meats, but I'd like to see data on that. Does, like, if we're only looking at fresh meat consumption, is there no association? Uh, I'd even like to see some laboratory data uh, showing, okay, well, it doesn't produce, like, these n nitroso compounds, hydroxyl-free radicals, uh, and it, it's not a risk, for, like, it doesn't uh, cause the oxidation of LDL particles. You're not showing that, but the research clearly shows there is an association between heme iron intake and heart disease risk. And you're not talking specifically about, um, pe like, you're not talking about people that, like, are not consuming meat and they have low iron levels. Is that relevant? Like deficiencies well, of iron? This didn't have anything to do with deficiencies. Uh, it just had to do with uh, percentage of consumption of heme iron. Um, there's also two other uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses I have on hand. Um, Iron and Cancer Risk, a systematic review and meta-analysis of the epidemiological evidence. Um, and again, in the abstract, uh, it says, uh, iron has been suggested as a risk factor for different types of cancers, mainly due to its pro-oxidant activity, which can lead to oxidative DNA damage. Uh, so... Heme iron is well known as a pro-oxidant. Now, I'm not an expert. Yeah, because on you, this is the problem. You can't, 
And we now this, I'm not an, like look. I admit I'm not an expert on. We wine. can't talk. This if is like a lot of these points you're bringing up, and we're talking about. We're, we we are simply not educated enough to speculate on this. That is simply well, it. Like well, we are. Uh, no, again, we can it, speculate, but we, there's like, you can't say these things you're saying. Like definitely, as you well, are. Well, look, it doesn't Frank, make any sense, Frank. The results are like according to these meta analyses, these large compilations of research. Heme iron is a pro-oxidant, and because of its pro-oxidant activity, it's associated Dude, I, with I told, a significantly I told you, I told you what risk my opinion on this study is, and the relative risk is too low in the context of what people would consider risk admissible. Isn't too low. Yes, it is for any no, for any not. study. Yes, if it's not a like if you're talking like 1.9, 2.5, then maybe we could look into it. But this is not anywhere close. Frank, that's per milligram of heme iron intake. So according to this meta-analysis, if you consume three milligrams of heme iron, you'd have about a double increased risk of heart disease. So, like, why is that hard for you to understand? Per milligram. That doesn't mean if you consume any heme iron at all, like, you have a 27% increased risk. No, it's per milligram. And again, there are other systematic reviews and meta-analyses linking the pro-oxidant effects of heme iron to cancer and also diabetes. Um, I'll link you another uh, meta-analysis and review. Dietary iron intake, body iron stores, and the risk of type 2 diabetes. This is not, this is not um, analysis. So all look, this says vast, is... Look, the vast majority of research, Frank, shows that heme iron intake is damaging to human health. Dude, this fucking, I, I'm not talking on this point anymore. This stu study you linked me is dog shit. Furthermore, we conducted meta-analysis for colorectal relative, is this even... This is so. Are you linking me different ones now? Am I looking at it? No, I, I just linked to you the one I, I mentioned. Well, you got three different ones. You got. I don't know. Are those those are? You did three different studies, right? That's it. Yeah, uh, one on heart, like a meta analysis on heart disease, meta analysis on diabetes, meta analysis on cancer. The last one's the diabetes one. Um, and it looks like the diabetes one has the full text available. Um, the the heme iron intake with risk of coronary heart disease meta analysis that you've been talking about for the okay, past twenty so, minutes is uh, the two. So sorry, just a second. The two meta analysis I linked on uh, cancer and diabetes, the full text are available. So if you want to read later uh, after the debate, you can. Uh, just th this first study you linked with the, the relative risk is from 1.04 to 1.67 so some found no association okay and the so dose like response of relative analysis. risk of chd for an increase of heme iron intake of one milligram a day was 1.27 that's not saying that that does not mean that one milligram per it's not per one milligram it means that these people increase their heme iron intake of one milligram per day, and this was their risk. This does not mean yeah. if you make it to two, it's going to be, you know, it's not going to, it's not multiplicative. If that doesn't, what you're saying is disingenuous, and you're interpreting the data in your favor. Oh, and, I think I even, understand what you're saying. Even heme if iron you, intake of one milli, uh, sorry, uh, the dose response risk ratio for coronary heart disease for an increase in heme iron intake of one milligram per day. I, I think I understand what you're saying. Uh, I misinterpreted it a bit. Um, but anyway, uh, if you add one milligram to That's your not, no, but that's not what the study says. You if just you add in, one milligram, so the relative risk, if you add one milligram of heme iron per day to your daily diet, you increase your risk of heart disease by nearly 30%. Or one or, or zero because there were some people in that study that no not had zero no. it says no the lowest was one point one one point zero four was the lowest which is insignificant that is not admissible data well no dose response risk ratio heme iron intake of one milligram per day was one point two seven and uh, it went from one point one to one point four seven okay I'm gonna be a little more serious I'm not entertaining that dog shit study anymore. I'm going to look at the second okay, one, great. Iron and Cancer Risk, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of the Epidemiological Evidence. You said this one has the full text, but the third one only is the one I saw with the full text. Uh, they both have a full text. Uh, they have a full text link on the top right-hand corner. Um, anyway, uh, the vast majority of data shows that heme iron intake is associated with an increased risk of... So this this the other study, Iron and Cancer Risk, a systematic review of meta-analysis of the epidemiological evidence, uh, blah, 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 dietary iron. Furthermore, we conducted meta-analysis for colorectal cancer risk, uh, 
confidence interval 1.00 to 1.17 colon 1.12 1.03 to 1.22 breast 1.03 and then 0.97 to 1.09 they actually found, it, found an inverse risk with breast cancer in some cases no, no and lung no, cancer like they found uh relative risk was 1.12 and the range was 0.98 to 1.29 so they found inverse risks on the majority of these studies which means no, they this didn't. is really dog shit Frank, do you understand Frank, what relative risk is averages do you understand what averages has nothing to do with with what they and if Frank, if you have, on on an individual level yeah you can see variations where you find an inverse relationship but on like the entire scale of the study they found more often than not it increased risk any of these studies you're linking me if you do a study and you find one person that contradicts the whole study it's that's it it's inadmissible evidence it, this is very no. this relative risk is dog shit no, and i'm not frank, this study not was out too we're works. moving on to the next study frank that's Sonitary not how iron technology intake works. that is exactly so how frank, it works and frank, if, if any Okay, so Frank, so Frank if you thing. find yeah. one person who smoked their entire life, they never got cancer, that means smoking doesn't cause cancer? No, but for something like smoking, the relative risk is exponentially higher. Let's look at the relative risk for smoking. Yeah, sure, but you, like the claim you're making is if you find one outlier in a data point, that makes the, the entire set of data worthless. So if you no, find it one doesn't person... because the relative risk for smoking is like... It's not 1.1. It's like fucking 70. Okay, so it's crazy. then so then rare outliers in a data set don't impact the the credibility. These are not of the rare outliers. Research. The large majority of these this data is on is either for or there's this data if no. anyone with half of a brain that looks at this data would say this is inadmissible because they didn't really show anything. Well, no, they actually I'm did gonna, find we're gonna, a, I'm gonna move on to the third study. I'm not entertaining cancer. I'm not entertaining these two other studies. I'm gonna move on to the third one and we'll take a look. Dietary iron intake, body iron stores, and the risk of type two diabetes, a systematic review and meta-analysis. Results uh Excess iron has been shown to induce diabetes in animal models. However, the results from human epidemiological studies linking body iron stores and iron intake to the risk of type 2 diabetes are conflicting. In the study, we aim to systematically evaluate the available evidence. So they're just trying to show uh some association with type 2 diabetes even though the past research has not shown anything um, well no the past research on diabetes didn't show anything because they didn't actually take into account heme iron just total heme i'm just iron reading i'm just reading, reading what this I'm just reading isn't what that what it says uh, i didn't read the maybe it said that next uh i'm not at i'm not looking at the full text i'm just looking at the abstract right now uh i'm not five studies is this the same? Is this the same one that you link? Is this the same one that you link me? Is this a? Is this one of the studies that meta analysis analyzed earlier? Is this? No, uh, this is a systematic review and meta analysis for uh, risk of type two diabetes and uh, uh, dietary iron intake and body iron stores. Uh, um, look, the pooled risk ratios for type two diabetes mellitus in individuals with the highest versus the lowest intake of ferritin levels was one point seven. Um, that's pretty damn significant. Uh, I didn't read this yet. Dietary total iron, non-heme iron, or supplemental iron intakes were not significantly associated with type 2, but why are you linking me in the study, man? What? Uh, the conclusion higher heme iron intake, iron heme iron intake. Iron, iron, iron stores were significantly associated with greater risk of type 2 diabetes. Yeah, but dietary total iron, so non heme iron, or supplemental yeah, iron so had nothing to do with it. This study says that the, their tissue levels of iron had a higher risk, but that had nothing to do with their dietary iron. This study is irrelevant. Well, no, it, it also looked at dietary iron intake. Iron it intake did, but it said that iron. dietary iron... Higher dietary total iron intake and increased body iron stores were significantly associated with a greater risk Hold of on, let me, let me wipe my eyes. Maybe I'm reading this wrong. Dietary total iron, non-heme iron, or supplemental iron intakes were not significantly associated with type 2... Maybe my... Yeah. Uh, yeah, Maybe exactly. I, not I told associated you, with type 2... I told you about this before because it doesn't take into account... Uh, heme iron. This is total iron. No, you so said no, 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 no. Hold on, stop, stop. 
Why are you, you cherry said picking? You said, I'm not cherry picking shit. I'm reading the studies. You fucking linked me and you didn't even read them yourself. Okay, Frank, like you said, Frank, listen, listen, I'm going to take my headset off. Let me let me say this. What you said when I was reading the background was that it said like, however, the results from human epidemiological studies linking body iron stores and iron intake are conflicting. That And, and then you said those previous studies that they did did not account whatever, but they did in this study. And now you're saying they didn't yeah, account they did, for it? Yeah, they did, and they found an association between heme iron intake, body iron stores, and type 2 diabetes. No, they just no, mentioned, no. No, listen, Frank, they mentioned in the conclusion that total dietary iron is not associated with risk of type 2 diabetes because your iron, like most people's iron, uh, primarily comes from plant-based sources. Uh, and they found that that non-heme iron wasn't associated with type 2 diabetes, so lentils, or sorry, iron from lentils isn't associated with type 2 diabetes because it's non-heme and uh, supplemental iron. Dude, you're also picking, you're, honestly, man, anyone that interprets this data, you're picking the wrong arguments to make. I could have myself, Frank, I could have made a better argument for- Frank, you're cherry picking one sentence out I'm of not, the meta analysis. No, you're but, but, you're, but if your point is that, your point earlier that you wanted me to discuss was that consuming dietary or any heme iron in general is causes diabetes. And now you're saying it's tissue levels that are a problem. That doesn't make any sense. I'm going to, if, if I was in, a, if I was in your position right now, arguing against me for heme iron, I could have fucking crushed me. Cause I know that heme iron can be shown in a very negative light in other aspects. What you're trying to show me right now is the last fucking thing you should be trying to show me because these studies, the relative risk is okay. inverse in some cases. And it Friend. doesn't, and even the conclusions of these studies doesn't make sense. I, I think for your credibility, you should move away from heme iron in regards to diabetes and oxidation and all of these things that are very apparent, even with the studies you're linking me, that there's nothing to do with them. Let's move Frank, on to something else. Frank, okay, I just want to be clear in this meta-analysis I linked for everybody who's interested, dietary iron intake, body iron stores, and the risk of type 2 diabetes, systematic meta-analysis and review, the authors found that the intake of heme iron and increased body iron stores were significantly associated with greater risk of type 2 diabetes. That, that's not however, what we're, we're discussing. However, that. what they found was total iron wasn't associated with risk of type 2 diabetes because that would include non-heme iron. Uh, non-heme iron wasn't associated with type 2 diabetes risk and supplemental iron was not associated with type 2 diabetes risk. So, uh, yeah, again, like heme iron intake is associated with risk of type 2 diabetes, and it's also associated with no, it's uh, not. risk of that, all that cancers. All that study says is disease. having higher tissue levels of iron. It has nothing to do with – the study specifically states that you linked that dietary iron has nothing to do with type 2 diabetes. That's exactly what the study says. It literally says we found no associations with any sort of dietary iron intake, whether supplements, heme iron, or non-heme iron. That's exactly what the study says. Amen. It has nothing to do. A meta-analysis of five studies gave a pooled risk ratio for type 2 diabetes mellitus uh, of 1.33 in individuals with the highest are you level talking about, intake are you, of heme iron. Are you talking about the third study right now? The, the diabetes meta-analysis. It, it, it clearly says the pooled risk ratio for type 2 diabetes with among the people with the highest intake of heme iron was 1.33. Which one are you reading right now? Dietary iron intake, body iron stores, and risk of type 2 diabetes, a systematic yeah. review and meta-analysis? Yeah. This yeah. is the one that specifically says dietary total iron, non-heme iron, or supplemental iron intakes were not significantly associated with type 2 diabetes. Yeah. Why the fuck do you keep hitting this, man? This means that dietary Frank. iron intake Frank. has nothing to do with it. Frank. There's a difference between total iron intake and heme iron intake. Most people get their, their iron, like the majority of it, from plant sources. So when you do total iron, 90% of that is probably plant iron, and the rest is, is heme iron. So it's not surprising they wouldn't find a, a big risk with total iron intake. They also didn't find a, a, an association with non-heme iron intake, so iron from lentils and supplemental iron and type 2 diabetes. But they did find an association between heme iron this intake. Is the same. This is, dude, iron. this is not, this is that exact, this is just a, one of the studies that they did a meta analysis on earlier. It had the same low relative risk ratios for iron. This is, that's not even, a relatively even if low I risk under, ratio. Even I, if I take the diabetes risk by 30%, 1.09 to 1.23, 1.19 to 1.48 was the risk ratio, and the average was 1.33. Well, no, type no, that's diabetes. looking, that's pulling together. Yeah. That's not pulling together just iron intake. That's pulling together. That's heme iron. 
Uh, that's pulling together. What is it pulling together? Honestly, what's the, look, I'll, I'll read so the it's sentence. It's pulling for together you. one milligram of heme iron. It's pulling together ferritin receptors, pooled RRs, lowest intake of ferritin. Uh, then they adjusted for inflammatory markers as well. So this is not just heme iron, man. If you're talking about heme iron and risk for this study, it's 1.09 to 1.23, which in any- No, 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 no Frank, Frank, you're, you're misreading things. So in this meta-analysis, the pool to risk ratio for type two diabetes in individuals with the highest levels of heme iron intake was 1.33. And they, they did uh, another risk ratio for uh, a daily increment of one milligram of heme iron, uh, which was uh, a risk ratio of 1.16. Dude, honestly, like, two different things. I, I, like this has been like, honestly, like at least two hours out of this to me has just been completely unproductive and bullshit and going back and forth on a study that okay, isn't well, really admissible for well, everyone. Frank, um, I just want to know uh, why you think it's a good idea to intake any amount of heme iron when the vast majority of research shows it's harmful to human health. First of all, your research does not show that at all, and okay. I will, and uh, and, sure. and you can let the you can let the people chat can, interpret. People can read. People can read the these studies, uh, and when the authors say there was a significant increase in risk of heart disease, diabetes, and cancer from intake of heme iron, like I'm sure they'll interpret it that, yeah, they didn't find any association between heme iron intake and risk of disease. Well. No, they will. When people read the studies and then they look at the relative risk and then they look at the methods they use and the actual data they use for these studies, they probably laugh in your face. But to answer the question of should we be taking heme iron, I, t I said this earlier, it's in the context of the whole food in itself. It's not, you're not taking, phys you're not physically taking heme iron and ingesting it you're ingesting it in the context of either of an inflammatory food such as whether it's bacon or sausage or some processed meat or you're consuming it in its natural context and then if you wanted to discuss okay what are the negative things of consuming those foods and those foods that's a discussion you can have if you're trying to isolate this compound and use these studies with these super low relative risk ratios, it does not make any sense. Okay, well, Frank, do you have any evidence that consuming heme iron from ideal sources is not linked with uh, any type of disease? You and can't, do you have laboratory data or like any kind of mechanistic data that would suggest that? Th this is not, the burden of proof of me is not necessarily okay, to prove so that consuming- Okay, so you don't have any evidence for these claims, okay. No, the, so the, the, move on. the evidence behind the claim is if you're consuming foods in order to get adequate nutrient density in the diet, that heme iron is present in those foods invariably. O okay, Frank, I asked you if you have any evidence that heme iron from ideal sources, whatever those might be, do you have any evidence that heme iron from these ideal sources do, does not increase risk of chronic disease, either uh, from population-based data or from laboratory data. Do you mean like um, a positive association with higher heme iron levels or just the foods that contain heme iron? No, just like the foods that contain heme iron. Say if you're eating grass-fed beef liver or something like that, or whatever you'd consider ideal heme iron intake, whatever that is. Uh, do you have any data, whether it's population-based or just l like laboratory experimental data, do you have any like data showing that heme iron intake from these ideal sources is not associated or could not increase disease risk. You just mean like anything in regards to consumption of pretty much any animal product that contains heme, uh, heme iron that shows no, lower I'm risk? No, I'm talking or... about what you consider an ideal source. Oh, like, um, man, is that, well, what would I look for? Because, like, Frank, uh, vegans don't have a higher risk of, like, iron deficiency than meat eaters. So what would be the point of consuming I mean, like, like what do you want me to, like, do you want me to show, like, like... Well, you're claiming that... Like, consuming fish is associated with higher levels of... Like, no, no, Frank, you're, you're claiming that the research I linked was using less than ideal sources of heme iron for their the basis for their research uh do you I, have, the only thing i'm saying about your research is the relative risk is too low to get any conclusive data that's all i'm saying okay so like a 30 percent increased risk is insignificant to you no the, the the point is not that it's the, the 
first of all, that's not the average in all those studies. Second of all, it varies even in that study with you're saying 30%, it was like from 1.04 to 1.67. And anyone who looks at relative risk ratios and data understands that that is not admissible as correct data. I'm not, I'm not explaining this again. I've explained this five times. So what do you want me to show you right. that consuming so, a food that has heme iron in it can be beneficial for your health? Uh, yeah, well, no, like I, I'm asking you, do you have any data showing that heme iron from ideal sources doesn't have this pro-oxidant effect or doesn't increase risk of chronic disease like heart disease, diabetes, cancer? Uh, maybe this is something, hold on. And what would be the point of consuming heme iron in the first place? It's not the necessarily the point of, as I said, it's not necessarily the point of consuming heme iron. The point is to consume high vitamin foods that just inherently have heme iron. Okay, well, vegans don't have an increased risk of iron deficiency, vitamin A deficiency, vitamin K deficiency. So I, I'm not really understanding the argument here. Uh, I'm just, let me just read something here real quick. In Texas, all hair muscles are better than smoking women have. In current, smoking women higher in Texas. Okay, so this study, I mean, listen, man, honestly, I don't have really, I don't really have good studies that I would really like to be using for this or uh, things that I think are great illustrations of my point, but it's definitely something we can uh, discuss on. So this study that I just found, this talks about dietary intake of iron, heme iron, magnesium, and pancreatic cancer risk in European Prospective Investigation of the Cancer Nutrition Cohort. And if we look at the results, intakes of total iron and heme iron were highest in Spain, Greece, and France, although for heme iron, dietary intakes were even higher in Sweden and lowest in the United Kingdom. The relative distribution across the countries is comparable. And then we look at the data, magnesium intake, iron intake, heme iron, uh, the median. So if we look at the heme iron intake in, let's say, what's the high one? What was the highest one here? If we look at the heme iron median, uh, um, let me just link the, the image address of the chart. Uh, I'm not sure if you're looking at the, right, the same one as me. So that's the image address of the chart. And I actually, I have not looked at this before. I'm going through it right now. Just keep that in mind. Uh, if we look at the heme iron intake in Denmark, it's 1.9. And the age years median is 56. And that's the highest one. If we look at low heme iron, which is the UK, 0. 0.5, then the age median is 52. So there's, they're actually three years lower life expectancy. But then if we look at the, the, just the iron intake in general between the UK and Denmark, it was slightly lower in the UK. And the magnesium intake is only slightly lower too. So the most, they literally consume four times the amount of heme iron in Denmark and they have a three year age median that's higher. But is the age median, what does that indicate? That's just. Well, Frank, none of this is really what I was asking for. Um, you're trying to claim that uh, the research I, I referenced. Um, they were focusing on non-ideal sources of iron. And uh, on top of that, the the risk ratios weren't significant enough. It should, no, they're not. They're, that's the only basis for the, your studies. The risk ratios are not significant enough. So why is a risk ratio of 1.27 not significant? Because it's not 1.27. It's 1.0 whatever to 1.6 whatever. That That's why it's not significant. If they find yeah. outliers, in, and this Frank. is... If Frank, you look at risk ratios to... for things that are commonly accepted, it's way different. Like, let me go look at the Wait, risk what? of, uh, let me go look at the risk of colorectal cancer and heme iron real quick. Give me like two minutes. Well, Frank, give me an example of something that has an adequate like risk ratio where you could associate it with disease, like any food. What, what do you mean? Like, you want me to find a food that has a high risk ratio with disease? Yeah, like what's a food that you would consider has that has a an adequate risk ratio for a particular disease? Uh, it should be what I'm about to look at right now. The um the processed meats, uh, if what I remember is correct in this study. Because by your standard, I I literally think there's absolutely no food that you can say is increases risk of disease. If you need a risk ratio of like two. <sighs> 
Yeah, uh, where is the relative risk? Where is the summary? Uh, might not be the right one. So what are you trying to find? I'm just looking up the risk for uh, colorectal cancer and processed meat. Okay, I don't think you'll find a risk ratio of two. Yeah, I'm just looking at the data I had. There was something I wanted to just look over. So, uh, so you wanted to also see something that just showed that consuming meat has inverse associations with uh, just colorectal cancer. Would that be adequate? For the well, an association, or sorry, you're you're saying processed meat? No, this is just regular meat, like um, like pork or lamb has both an inverse and uh, positive association with uh, colorectal cancer. It shows both on drastically different ends. So uh, I'm not understanding what you're saying. Um, like it's just pretty much showing that they looked at. They looked at like a, a regular meat product that maybe I would consider healthy, such as uh, just a, a steak or something. And they showed that it has like a 0.5 to 1.5 uh, risk ratio, which means that, you know, whole meat in general has no risk associated with colorectal cancer. And the reason that's relevant is because colorectal cancer is probably uh, direct is not probably, but colorectal cancer is directly associated with heme iron and nitrate composition of the food but okay. if if we have if i'm looking i see another study right now uh case control studies published between well, 2003 and 2007 on the relationship between processed meat and taking colorectal cancer risk in china the preserved meats have a 1.5 to 2.9 and a 1.9 to 3.8 so odd ratio is 2.7 and 2 in china for that study um okay so there are definitely uh you know that there's that's an example of the colorectal cancer risk being pretty significant you know it's almost three uh and then there's and then there are if i know you were gonna if I knew okay you were gonna, well what about heart disease and what the heme iron like anything just like heart if disease you're say a, a risk ratio of like 1.27 isn't significant then is there any food? So, or I'm sorry, man. Just, can... just real quick, uh, you edit the well, the silence or sorry, is it just do you edit the silence or this is all just live? This like is all when live. you publish it. Okay, so uh, I did want to apologize for not getting all this research in front of me and making this go back and forth a lot. Uh, so, did we want to just kind of summarize like our thoughts well, on on iron and heme iron? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, the majority of the data just shows that heme iron intake is harmful to human health. Uh, you can find uh, some research that doesn't find an association, but overall, like, uh, and I think especially for heart disease and diabetes, uh, there is a pretty strong association. So I guess let's, let's just kind of, so you, sh so basically the heme iron thing in regards to the, the, the oxidation and the cholesterol and all of that stuff, we don't have enough, you know, information behind the metabolic processes to really discuss that in depth. In regards to heme iron and, and nitroso compounds, we can safely say that certain processed meat products are literally poison in regards to colorectal cancer. In sure. regards to uh, in regards to the actual studies you linked in in regards to the heme iron associations, the relative risk is too low to say anything. And in regards to the studies that I just looked at now, there is us, and this confirms the um, you know the that you know processed meat, especially like the Chinese processed meat that they were consuming is should not be consumed by anyone and that the but the risk for actual meat and like whole cuts of beef is actually inversely associated you know they found positive associations with colorectal cancer and consuming just regular fresh meat uh, so there's definitely how uh, strong was a the lot of conflicting. it was literally 0.5 it was literally like uh and then let me like i'm looking 
I, I'm looking at the sheet okay, right well, now. Frank, another thing to consider is heart disease prevalence is so incredibly high to begin with that you also have to consider when you, you see a risk ratio of 1.27 or something, that's probably more significant than it sounds. You mean because in the context of their overall health? Yeah, I mean, in the general population, heart disease risk is so high to begin with. Um, like an increased risk ratio of 1.27 is more significant than it sounds. I mean, especially if you consider, you know, hey, maybe just this one substance is 1.27. Then if you take 30 other goddamn things and they're all 1.27, that's where we have an issue. Um, no, there's definitely a lot of truth and merit to that. Uh, but if, I mean, do we want to just start talking about like, uh, do we want to keep talking about specific things like heart disease in relation to meat or do we just want to talk about how overall most people that consume animal well, products are just consuming them in the context of such unhealthy diets? Okay, well, you know what? Um, I, th I think we should kind of wrap up the health topic and I'd like to discuss the ethics here. Um, if you want to have like any kind of final statements about these things, uh, uh, that'd be fine. Yeah, I just wanted to apologize again for me not having um, a lot of things together. I, you know, I've been going on some uh, job interviews lately. I haven't had uh, really any time to sleep, let alone uh, put a lot of effort into this. And I do appreciate you taking the time to discuss these topics with me, despite my, uh, you know, having to kind of fumble and get the studies and talk about things. But, you know, specifically all these points, I think there's in, in a, about half the cases, there's definitely associations in the context of standard American diets. And most people right now where there are definitely detrimental health effects to consuming a lot of these substances that are in meat. And on the other hand, there's a lot of studies that don't show association. And we have to understand that the context that they are being consumed in is more important, as well as other factors like lifestyle and, and other things can kind of just really set the precedent for. Uh, and I guess the, the vitamin thing, you know, the plant versus animal vitamins is, is especially a topic that needs to be researched more and just especially us without the context of biochemistry and the lack of understanding of all of these things to go in depth and really dispute these things, especially with, you know, just the, the few studies we have and what they're relevant to is it's very difficult to, um, to really say anything definitive with the exception of a few things. Okay. So, um, my final statement about the health topic is I think there's, uh, an adequate amount of research showing that animal products do increase cr uh, chronic disease risk in humans. And um, if we look at studies like the Adventist cohorts, uh, it's pretty clear that lifelong vegans can be perfectly healthy, live very long, uh, healthy lives free of chronic disease. Again, uh, vegans in the Adventist cohorts, lowest rates of diabetes, heart disease, cancer, hypertension, lowest rates of uh, obesity. And uh, in the Adventist cohorts, they were the second longest living. Uh, they were beaten out by an average of two to three years by fish eaters. But uh, nonetheless, you can eat, you can live a very long, healthy life as a vegan, and for that reason, um, I think it's unethical to, uh, you know, kill animals, exploit them, uh, you know, through agriculture, um, and that'll be the segue into the ethics topic. Can um, I touch slightly on you saying the long, healthy, happy vegan thing? Uh, sure. The Adventists. So, in uh, what's interesting is it was, I believe, it was a Georgian or Siberian group of people and they had a very very high infant mortality rate it was something like 25 or, or 30 like 25 to 35 percent i believe and after infant mortality their life expectancy was like over 90 it was crazy and uh their for diet for what which group of people i think it was georgians i don't want to say specifically but let me finish the story before um georgians uh yeah so but the point people is that in florida no like uh the Georgian country in uh okay I, I haven't heard of this sorry uh no Georgians are cat Kartvelians are nation and Caucasian ethnic group native to Georgia uh, let me just look exactly where on the map it is uh okay so you're saying if you account for child mortality they had a very high average no, length, let me like, life story, expectancy. this is actually in agreement with you on the plant-based diet so these people had a high infant mortality rate but once they got past that infant mortality rate, they lived very old and their diets were actually life expectancy after, I mean, after let me, if I could try to find the, I try to Google this earlier. Um, because right now, as far as I know, uh, oh, it's not, that it's definitely, it's definitely not yeah. that it was, um, but these people, no, my point is these people, I think their diet was like 80 to 90, 80, almost 80, at least 80, maybe, yeah, at least 80% 
plant-based. So they mm -hmm. had a lot of heirloom grains. They had a lot of, you know, they made their own vodka. They made their own, um, they made their whatever, just like living off the land, so to speak, but very heavily plant-based off of grains, uh, prepared in traditional ways, you know, re soak the grains, reduce the anti-nutrient content, especially that's the only grain they're eating. And they lived very long and happy lives. But one thing to keep in mind is, and all of these other civilizations that live really long, I've noticed they're very, very active. Like these people would literally hike for 10, 12 hours a day. Uh, there's definitely some factors in that. But so to summarize that, to my understanding, you can live a very long and healthy life on a plant-based diet. But these people had, you know, 10, 20% of their intake was from those high vitamin animal, food, animal foods. And can we replicate that with modern supplements? Possibly. So it's definitely interesting that it seems that you can live a long and happy life life as a vegan outside of the context of that infant mortality because the reason those people had a high infant mortality rate is because they did not have the nutrition that they needed in regards to certain vitamins and fats during the developmental stages of the children okay uh, that, do you know what in particular no but if you can imagine if the only food they have to eat is grain for a period of months and and they don't have any meat or fat they just don't have a really a source of fat soluble vitamins at all I mean, that's pretty, it's pretty okay, much, well, it, they it didn't have just as well be something like B12 or iodine. Yeah. But in the context of their diet, it was just, it was just so low, like right. Vegans now they get so much more B12 iron and fat soluble vitamins, especially like people eat a lot of avocados and like the, you have to understand these people did not have access to plant-based fats. You know, they didn't have access to that. So it's definitely interesting to see if we could replace the animal fats with modern methods of plant fats. But that was just something I want to throw in there. Uh, some interesting okay. anecdotes. So uh, you do believe you can live like a long, healthy life as a vegan? Well, yeah, you can, but it's also interesting. You know, you, you know how like, um, like us Italians are pretty short and how people in certain areas of the world have various statures depending on their past diets and uh, history. I think that has a lot to do with um, you know, Italians are, it's speculative that the reason Italians are shorter is because they had a higher amount of grain in their diet and lack of maybe not as many vitamins as someone in a different part of the world would have during their developmental stages. So there's something to be spoken about the necessity of having a certain amount of vitamins during growth. And if that can be obtained, uh, on a plant-based diet, that's the only questionable okay, thing that well, I had. On that. Right. Well, but during infancy, um, like, you know, you, the, your main fat source is going to be breast milk. The question, the only question in that is if, uh, like during the pregnancy period and the gestation period, if the mother had adequate vitamins in her diet, you know, most of the time for well, the first that can affect it. Sure. Yeah. No, that was just something to bring up. I mean, we don't have to dwell too much on that. Okay, But uh, otherwise you do believe that, uh, people can live like long, healthy lives in a vegan diet. Yeah. Outside of that initial developmental context. Okay. And modern intervention um, so it, yeah, it might be possible. so why do you think it's uh, morally acceptable to uh like kill and eat animals should i say that like i have actually slaughtered animals myself is that important in this argument like i'm willing to do it sure. is, because i know that's I, I know some people have a problem with people that just go to the supermarket and buy meat you off the shelf that up. sure yeah so i mean i know a lot of people like i really do listen if I, if it was up to me and I could just let the animal live and live off of its milk and eggs and things like that, I would do it. Cause I really do appreciate life in general, whether it's, uh, you know, a plant or an animal, I really do appreciate life. And I understand, uh, you know, in the context of my health, when I'm taking the life of an animal, um, you know, it, it is an inherently cruel thing that I think has just been done for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. And it's just part of kind of almost human nature at this point as, as just predators and hunters, that it's something we've done and kind of accepted. But, uh, the, the question about, is it acceptable? And to, to get on the topic of morals, I guess a, a point I could just say is I respect animals. I make sure that the animals I purchase and the food that I purchase lived a happy and healthy life and that the slaughter process was as humane and caused as little pain to the animal as possible. Okay. So, um, uh, like, I think we can understand that causing unnecessary suffering is wrong, but mm -hmm. uh, why do you draw the distinction uh, at suffering and not include uh, killing? 
So like, why are you fine with killing, but you're not okay? The, the with only reason I'm okay with uh, I what's what's it called when you have cognition and you're like aware of yourself as an animal and uh, you ever yeah like well, just like yeah, yeah like fer you know how like some children can be feral sometimes like that are left abandoned. I don't know if necessarily children, but a better example would be like feral cats and how they're 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 living off of their instincts. And I think us humans at a time just lived off of our instincts, so to speak. And having this cognition and ability to understand that killing an animal might not be what we would want to happen to ourselves is, might not be good, but it's just been part of us and part of nature. And it's weird because our instincts and what we've been doing for years and years and years have been hunt, kill the animal. This is how we need to live and how we need to survive. How do you but know that's an instinct? I mean, because, you know, primitive humans before we really had cognition and before we really had, um, and even if you look at, there's a great book called The Hunting Apes, where monkeys and chimpanzees would just, they would hunt and, and get meat and, and very, very brutal stories, to be honest, but. Well, sure. Um, this, like, this can all be a part of culture. How do you know that's an instinct? Well, I mean, my, my point was that it used to be an instinct and now it's become part of culture and just things that we've done. Right, so how does that justify killing? You mean in a sense, I mean, in a sense of like getting nutrition for ourselves and surviving ourselves? Well, Is like, that like the you reason? know, you, you've already agreed at this point that you can be healthy on a vegan diet or uh, at the very least a plant-based diet. Like, let's say, okay, eat, like for the sake of argument, I don't actually believe this myself, but you could at least be vegetarian and, you know, maybe eat some eggs and dairy here and there and still be in good health. Um, so why wouldn't you like at least reduce the amount of animal products you're consuming just to, uh, not kill as many sentient beings? Are you talking about like me personally? Yeah. Yeah. You I, personally. I mean, I try to, I mean, I consume less than 1500 calories a day. Uh, I eat literally minimally as possible. Um, I used to try to, I've always tried to use milk and dairy products, but I'm very, very allergic. I'm actually trying them again this week. Probably a bad idea. Uh, but and in all of my attempts to do this, it's pretty much the only reason I haven't been able to to reduce my food intake. And I believe that, you know, from everything to just consuming less calories to saving money to being less wasteful to having to kill fewer animals, um, that it's it's an important thing to do. And I've actively tried to do that. But with my severe food allergies and intolerances and uh, ability to just feel good and energized on certain foods, I've just used that as the justification for me to feel healthy and be a productive human being. So, um, um, Frank, have you ever gotten uh, a test for candida or uh, SIBO, like bacterial infection in the uh, small intestine? I've gotten, or, yeah, I've gotten, uh, I didn't have any of them. I mean, they, the doctor just pretty much said, I had tests on the, tests? I didn't have tests on the, um, I didn't have tests on the, the candida came back, just like, didn't matter at all. The, the SIBO, Ooh, no. Did it come but, back positive or not? No, no, negative. Um, but this dude, you have to keep in mind, like this was, I was on a, I was on a, I've been on a carnivore diet for six years and, but I had that test like three years ago. Like I'm not gonna, there's no way like I would have had candida three years ago after being on a carnivore diet for three years. Well, um, no, you can, that's not going to just cure candida. No, I didn't, I didn't have it, uh, to answer that question. But what is that? What is the, that's just the relevance to my health well, in general, my gut well, health. You're you're talking about food intolerances. Uh, mm. A lot of the time, people who think they have like a food intolerance or an allergy, it's actually caused by uh, candida, like a fungal infection. No, I mean, I've had, I, I've had allergy infection. testing. I've seen, you know, I've seen. Well, uh, it's different than an allergy te test. So what's, what's the doctor gastroenterologist? What's it called? Uh, yeah. The doctor? Yeah, I've, um, seen, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of them as well in New York City. Um, well, you want to make sure that you don't have bacterial overgrowth in your small intestine. And you also want to make sure that you don't have any parasites, candida or fungal infection, because all of those things can make you sensitive to certain foods because they prevent you from breaking down things like oxalates, salicylates, histamines that are common in plant foods that normally wouldn't be a problem because your body can easily break down. And I mean, them. I do have a, a pretty s severe histamine intolerance in general. Okay. I mean, that's, um, that's one, one thing worth so, mentioning about my allergies. So have you ever actually gotten um, a, a test, like these tests done to confirm that you don't have any parasites, uh, bacterial overgrowth in your small intestine, and uh, candida fungal infection? I mean, I had, stool, I had stool samples taken and had it tested in December of last year. Do you know specifically everything. what for, though? 
they did the well, they did bacteria, they did the parasites, and then the, but the candida was before that. The candida was like a year or two before that. But I definitely don't have any fungal bacteria infections or. Okay, I I just because these are confirmed with both uh, stool and urine tests. I like no, if I, I literally you, I literally make... had a stool test like uh, eight well nine but months ago you... now. Like, do you know what they were actually testing for? Yeah, that it was literally because I ate like five pounds of Alaskan salmon that had worms in it. So I got the test for the parasites. And then they okay, also tested the back, full bacteria. They did a full bacteria panel on the stool, whatever that was. Uh, and okay, no, I'm yeah. not sure if that actually tests for bacterial overgrowth in the stool. You mean intestine. like fungus? Uh, no, for well, small intestine. Bacterial intestines, overgrowth. No, in I, small I did not get the only test to clarify the Candida test was like three years ago the okay. st the stool sample test which was in december of 2017 was all the bacteria and the parasites okay um this still isn't very clear it, it like i'm not sure if you actually got the test done for bacterial overgrowth um so that might be something you want to look into mm -hmm. and there's also two tests involving that like a urine and stool test I so had no. I mean, might want to look into, the, into that I again. Know, I don't know specifically if they, they tested for that, but it was both a urine and a stool test, and I did it twice, like ten weeks apart. Uh, but the even all of these hypothetical things, what is? I mean, what is your like solution to these well, problems? I, I, is it an elimination well, diet? Is it medication? Is it certain antihistamine drugs? Well, it depends. Uh, like, if you have bacterial overgrowth in your small intestine, you'd want to take um, antibiotics. If it's like a fungal infection, you'd want to take an antifungal. If it's parasitic, antiparasitic medication. Um, I'm just thinking that these food intolerances you have, um, it's likely due to some sort of uh, like intestinal problem you have that might be able to be fixed with medication. I mean, I've had you have to understand. I've had these food allergies and problems my whole life. Uh, yeah. Even before this diet and. Uh, but dude, I have literally fasted for three weeks on just water. So, well, that's not really going to do anything. I don't. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to bring that problems. up in hypothetical if that would actually affect how much that would affect you know that bacteria if it would. Uh, no, it, it wouldn't really. A lot of people think it would, but it doesn't. You'd need antibiotics to like mm -hmm. get rid of a uh, like bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine and you know other things like that. Or if it's a parasite, um, it, it might be worth looking into because it sounds like you'd actually prefer to eat a plant-based diet, wouldn't you? Uh, like for ethical reasons, at least. Um, you know, I'd have to on like I've tried in the past incorporating more plant-based foods, and I've just haven't been able to. Uh, for like, like what foods in particular um, have you tried? Like uh, like naturally fermented iron corn bread. Uh, various heirloom grains, naturally fermented, sweet potatoes, blueberries, macadamia nuts, uh, seaweed. You even just... have problems with blueberries? Yeah. Um, like what happens when you eat, when you eat blueberries? Uh, they come out as blueberries. Oh, really? That's weird. <laughs> and this wasn't like one time, man. I had blueberries for about a month straight and they were still doing that. So, okay. Um, yeah, um, like a big problem that I believe is, uh, you know, you got to think of a blue, like I just have that intolerance to foods that are old, you know, like the blue, like what was the blueberry pick two months ago, thrown frozen, thrown in a bag. And then I get it two months later, you know, like the, well, most people don't have these sorts of problems. So it sounds like there's some sort of issue with your digestion that could possibly be fixed. No, I mean, I agree completely that mo a lot of people would probably be able. And as I spoke about earlier, all these indigenous groups consumed 50 to 60% of their calories from, well, not, uh, maybe like 55 to 65 percent of their calories from animal foods and then the remainder from plant foods and there were uh varying kind of depends it depends on the tribe you're talking about and yeah that's what I was, yeah yeah for sure season. yeah that's like, like, exactly uh, like huge source of calories for them was honey yeah and that's... they also eat blueberries and shit yeah um, every every i'm i'm not against incorporating plant-based foods into your diet for both nutrient density and just you know, out of enjoyment as well as just energy. I'm not against that. It's just uh, the problem for me is the plant foods that I have access to and the ones I have purchased are either exponentially more expensive than meat or uh, I just can't tolerate them. Those are my personal issues with uh, it. Okay, so for everyone else, like the general population, would you say they should follow a plant-based diet for at least ethical reasons? I mean, the Swiss in the Lo Valley, which is in Weston Price's book, 
all they ate for all they really ate was cheese, dairy, and rye bread, and they were perfectly healthy. So in the context of that diet, I mean, that's, that's perfectly possible if your gut can tolerate those foods. Does that answer well, that question? No, I, I'm not saying that. Like, I mean, a, an actual vegan diet, would you recommend people eat a, a vegan diet for ethical reasons? For ethical? Well, if we want to talk about ethical reasons, then we got to start talking about, you know, where were your plant foods from and how does that affect things? That's like, okay, if we're well, talking about, like, are we talking about strictly ethically, like the treatment of animals? Because we know with a lot of modern farming methods, like habitats are displaced, herbicides and pesticides. That's going to of, happen regardless. Like it's, that's going to happen regardless. And we know that there's inherently some, but the question I guess that I would like to bring up is, you know, would you rather, you know, for me, the way I look at it is, you know, participate in local agriculture, make sure, you know, the animal that you buy or purchase or the dairy you get is from an animal that has lived a healthy life. And then the plant foods that you buy are local and not produced in that, you know, conventional monocropping or whatever. That to me is ideal, whether or not, whether the food is animal or plant-based that you're supporting kind of almost local or smaller agriculture. But then when you get into the debate of, you know, should someone, you know, for me, if you start going to the supermarket and buying stuff, I'm like, well, compared to what I just mentioned, that's already a negative, isn't it? Cause you know, you're with the previous thing, you know, you could be, you know, ethical and beneficial for the environment. But now when you start buying stuff in the supermarket and questioning where foods are from and how the meat was treated or where the grain, or maybe, you know, if that grain was, who knows what, like that, that becomes questionable for me to, I guess, to answer your question, me personally supporting local agriculture, I'm not worried about those factors of, you know, things that are going to happen anyway, like a, a fawn getting ground up in a harvesting machine and, or like mice getting displaced and then hawks eating them because they, they, you know, I'm not thinking about those things because I don't purchase food from those types of systems. Well, you're going to displace natural native wildlife if you support any form of agriculture. Uh, I mean, in the and context like, of like, um, especially if you're talking about grass fed animals, like the amount of land use is massively increased. So you're actually well, going in, to end up displacing in, in the animals. United, in the United States, we don't really, uh, we don't necessarily displace other animals for pasture, but in other countries, that is a big problem. Well, you do. Well, you, you do. Um, like small rodents are displaced by, uh, like grass fed pasture raised cattle. I mean, yeah, but what's the difference between like, um, I mean, yeah, we're, we're doing it ourselves inherently, but, uh, isn't that more of like a na like, let's say like a, a group of, I don't know, some bison roamed across the plains and found themselves in a new area. Uh, there's a difference between, well, no, they'd get preyed upon, uh, because they're not in their, you know, they're not in their native environment. That yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I agree, I agree with that. But, uh, like the, the thing too is Frank, um, regardless of the method of agriculture, um, more animals die in the animal agriculture industry than in plant agriculture. Um, that, I mean, that's, you know, the question that I would ask is, you know, what's worse, what's worse killing one cow to feed yourself for a year or what, you know, how many animal, like what, then you have to place a value on sentient beings. That's like, well, it, one cow wouldn't feed you for an entire year. I mean, on a zero carb carnivore diet, it could. No, uh, I, I don't think so. Um, uh, like, and again, per well, unit of land, there's uh, a much greater yield for, well, uh, I mean, it takes, calories. it only takes, it's depending on the quality of pasture between one to two acres per uh, cattle grazing, but the, the hanging one weight to two acres for like in the context of the whole farm, it's usually one to anywhere. It depends. It's, it could be as low as one. It could be as high as three acres, depending on the pasture and the irrigation. Uh, for the okay, cattle, I I think you're way underestimating that. that no, that's that's not low. for one animal. One animal, that is it. And that's you keep in mind. They graze the pasture. They and then a few weeks later, they're back to that same plot of land. That's the with proper pastoral management. But that's not what I wanted to focus on. Um, the hanging. I I mean, I used to I used to work in steakhouses and stuff, so I'm familiar with the the hanging weight of all these animals and. The modern grain-fed steer that people buy in when they're buying their Costco ribeyes, I don't really want to talk about that. We could talk about more because those animals will be up to 2,000 pound live weight. If we're talking about an average grass-fed animal, usually depending on the age, they can get up to like, and the breed and whether it's various factors, they can get up to like, 
I guess the high end would be not the high end, but a generous average would be 800 pounds live weight for a grass fed animal, which would yield about, uh, what is it? Maybe like 600 hanging weight. And then you have the organs that are not included that you can eat as well. So, you know, 600, 500, 600 pounds of meat and organs for a year, you know, maybe a couple of things thrown in there, but that's sustainable as a person's main caloric source for a year. Okay. Uh, well, Frank, this also isn't about one cow. Like again, you are going to displace natural native wildlife in whatever amount of land you're using, even if it's just uh, small rodents. Yeah. But if uh, you're to, like, also, no, well, those, the problem with that like, saying that is those also, rodents work with the ecosystem. And that's just, if you have an ideal pastured environment, the ecosystem, you know, the cows graze, the chickens come and eat the flies on the cow poop. Well, like you have a system that works there. They're going to compete with natural native wildlife and they're going to end up pushing out those rodents from that area of land because they're competing. The, the, but then the question is that we can't really answer is what's worse, you know, that well, we can. or, well, well, yeah, well, I mean, we, we can, can speculate. Uh, you know? Again, is that well, worse well, than you, is that worse than you taking, uh, a monocrop and, and displacing, you know, multiples more animals because of that. And well, uh, and again, like plant agriculture takes up less land. So yes, you'd end up displacing fewer animals. But it, I mean, let's talk about like avocados and, and the um, probably slave like conditions that people used to eat those foods there. I mean, there's various problems with a lot of foods that plant-based okay. dieters are emphasizing on as opposed to going well, local and, and eating local grains well, and local stuff. Listen, listen, Frank, like, I mean, you've worked in a slaughterhouse before. I don't know if you've ever been on the kill floor, but I've I've not, I haven't, talked... I haven't worked in one, but I have been in one. Yes. Okay. Like I've talked to a lot of slaughterhouse workers, gotten into fights with them and they're on edge like crazy because yeah. they're doing horrible fucking work that they don't want to do well keep in it's, mind uh well, the look, slaughterhouses like, you're talking about or not the slaughterhouses i'm talking about okay well no all, all these animals go to the same slaughterhouses um the like the only exception is maybe fucking mennonites and um i'm not talking about i i dude i go to muslim butchers for my meat that's what I go to. Okay. Well, I don't go to there's actually, slaughterhouses. There's a kosher and halal slaughterhouse in Toronto, and I see what they do. Um, it's it's a video up on my channel. It, it's in Toronto, major city. Um, they hang these animals up, uh, upside down, slash their throats open while they're fully conscious. Uh, by the time they start skinning them, uh, some of them are still conscious, uh, and they don't give a shit. Okay. So you might look, you might not like me for saying this, but I did that myself on Monday. We we took. A uh, little Billy boy, we hung him up on the hooks, and I slit his throat, and we let him bleed out. What did you and, What did you feel after doing that? Uh, you know, I felt like I was doing it better than going into the supermarket and buying my fucking meat. Well, I honestly was bad. I wasn't happy about it, to say the least. You know, right. I understand I had to take the life of the animal, and uh, it was kind of well, necessary for my survival, but. Uh, you know, well, it was done I mean, with it was done with respect and as as clean as possible. Well, Frank, like I can understand that point of view, but I've been to these slaughterhouses where people do this shit all fucking day long. They're constantly on edge. And I no, I agree with you. you. Know, what those people do well, is not well, listen, acceptable. Well, well, listen, like they're constantly on edge, and they they're very quickly to get into fights with you because yeah. they're so pissed off from working in the shit all day. Yeah, from killing the um, animals. And, and like, look, uh, what, like the most recent statistic was like 97% of animals are like factory farmed. Yeah, that's, um, def that's probably so, like you're talking about the vast, vast, vast majority, nearly 100% of the industry works like this. Mm -hmm. And you think that's like better than, okay, you know, avocado farmers getting kind of cheated out of a decent deal for the crops. Like, okay, that's bad. But Picking avocados, I don't think it's nearly as stressful as having to slit animals' throats open. I mean, it's not necessarily about um, it's not necessarily about you know the physical act of picking avocados or what these slaughterhouse workers have to do. It's it's the whole picture. Right. You know, it's like these but, these grain fed animals that they you know they wean them off the mother too early. They put them on pasture for whatever period of time. Then they feed them this crude soy. 
And then they go to the slaughterhouse. Like these animals have lived miserable, unhappy lives. And then they get slaughtered by miserable people that are working in these slaughterhouses. Well, That's there's a reason this is going on in the first place. It's because it's way more efficient, takes up way less land, and it makes it cheap and affordable enough for people to eat and but, it supplies the demand you know there, there have been a lot of people that are way more educated in regards to pastoral management and agriculture than me that you know it is possible to move towards more sustainable agriculture it, but that's not sure. what people want people don't want to people want to spend a dollar a pound on chicken breast they don't want to spend sure. three dollars a pound people want to buy those costco ribeyes for eleven dollars a pound they don't want to have to do what i do they don't want to have to go down to the muslim slaughterhouse buy a whole animal and i was boiling i was boiling the vertebrae and the you know i was eating foods i didn't necessarily want to you, eat out of necessity. Bought a whole animal yeah it was the what whole was lamb. Uh, whole uh, lamb how much did it cost how much did it cost i bought a six the live weight was 60 pounds it costed two hundred seventy dollars, and that should feed me for about three weeks. Three weeks. Okay, yeah. I've like, I've bought, I think, a thirty-pound bag of lentils from Costco. That lasts me for several months. The the, you, the like, nutrition and the the there's a lot. Like I'm more not saying I'm not saying lentils are one hundred percent nutritionally complete, but you get a shit ton of nutrition. That's a staple of my diet, and that lasts for several months. And I really don't need to add too much. It, it, if cost is a comparison thing here, man, I'm not the guy to talk to. I, I literally used right. to go to the farmer's market and spend, I would spend $10 for a dozen turkey eggs. Like I would go buy, you know, a gallon of raw goat milk is at least $15. So this food, in order to support these local farmers and buy quality food, you need to pay a decent price. I mean, yeah, I could drive out it's to Pennsylvania and get, if I want to drive a while, I could get good prices on this. But, you know, sure. supporting local farmers is... Although in the context of how much money people spend on food in general, depending on your budget, it's not too much more. And a lot of people on the carnivore diet spend just as much as me. They just buy foods that they want to eat and foods that are way different than what I eat. Right. But this just isn't practical for the vast majority of people is what I'm getting at. Um, well, I mean, that depends. Exa that's I mean, that's right. How much effort do you want to put into caring about ethics and your lifestyle and the environment? How much effort do you want to put into it? Do you so, want to spend that ten dollars a pound for pastured chicken? Do you want to go down on your Saturday off, or do you want to go to you know the? Do you want to go to Cipriani and drink mimosas, or do you want to go down and? I smelled like fucking shit, man. I smelled terrible all day. I was sweating my guts out, cutting this animal open, putting this stuff away. I was willing right. to do that, but most people, I agree, most people are not. So given that, uh, wouldn't you recommend a vegan diet for the vast majority of people? You know, it's like, just given, I guess I don't like, like answering. I don't like answering these questions. You asked me like, yes or no. But, uh, what I can say about that is oddly enough, most people that go on, not oddly enough, but you know, most people that go on a vegan diet do get healthier because of how bad the standard American diet is. And I actually made a video that I think I deleted that said everyone should go vegan because it's better than what you're doing now. That's for sure. The only thing that might happen if you go vegan is you might get a B12 or iron deficiency, which happens. Um, but in, in regards to being optimally healthy, I think we need to look at fat soluble vitamin and vitamin intake more. But for, for a lot of people, unfortunately, and I, I, I don't, I don't want to speculate on a percentage, but in the United States, possibly 60 to 70% of people, maybe even more would see probably just it's overall healthier. And then there's maybe a select percentage of people that actually do eat fairly healthy and that get a decent amount of vitamins from certain foods that might see uh, differences, but uh, that's just speculation, man. That's not a you know definitive answer. Okay, so you can agree that it's a good idea to reduce animal product consumption as much as you can, at, at the very least. But what are you what are you talking about? Are you talking about because like Americans get like eleven to fourteen percent of their diet is protein, like it's not high, so reducing their animal well, intake. I think it's and more it, about replacing. Products aren't just protein. I think I think it's more about replacing shit in general with more whole foods. I think that's what I would agree on. Whether or not they're plant based is up to you, but I think just replacing those foods you're eating with either high quality plant based foods or high quality animal foods is what you should be doing. Okay, well, Frank, like let's say hypothetically, if you could be perfectly healthy on a vegan diet, you didn't have these digestive issues, would you do it? You know what's funny if. If you have, let's say someone develops perfectly and they had all the vitamins they need and they're this like, they're this like six foot two Adonis guy. And then what I, if, if I, if you had proper development and got to that point in your life where mortality and development are not an issue, and then you went on a plant-based diet, 
Yeah, to me, my answer would be as long as I'm getting enough fat soluble vitamins in my diet through supplements or other means, or maybe like eggs and milk. And I mean, not, I don't know if you're too, like, I don't know what your general consensus is on the vegetarian stuff, but yeah, I mean, that would be, you know, to get, you know, 20, 30% of my calories from high vitamin foods and then 70% plant-based. I wouldn't have a problem with that. No. Well, what about hundred percent vegan? If you didn't have these digestive issues and you could eat blueberries and whatever vegan foods and vitamins and supplements you needed to be healthy, would you? My issue, my, my issue would be is, all right, let me answer. I can answer that with this statement. If, if in regards to metabolic processes in the body, the vitamins and the fats and the cholesterol and everything that's needed for optimal cell function and metabolic function, if my body was able to do that on this diet, I would do it. But those things, the supplementing, those vitamins and the bioavailability and all those things to me, there just hasn't been enough research done on it. And I would honestly rather trust the natural foods in that context. Does that answer Okay. It? Well, given the fact that like, according to the Adventist cohorts, like vegans are very healthy. They're at least healthier than vegetarians and the general population, uh, lowest rates of chronic disease. Like that is an indication to you enough that like if you didn't have these digestive problems, you'd do fine on a vegan diet? Well, no, because you, like I spoke about those Georgians earlier, they're pretty much the op. Are they, you know, are they the opposite of the Maasai in regards to plant versus animal based diets? Yes, but they're both very active. They're both living their natural way. They both have very low stress lives. And to say that, I mean, I'm in agreement that a plant-based diet you can be healthy on. It's just to me, the only thing that I think is questionable is just that base vitamin content. That's my only concern. Well, Frank, the Maasai had very high rates of heart disease. Like you even admitted this yourself. Like the prevalence of the disease was very high. It's just the mortality of the disease was disproportionately low. Yeah, but when I'm 90 years old and my, uh, my aorta is like this big and I'm still alive, Maybe there's a little well, fat in it, but you you don't know what that's from, uh, and these are like very small populations spread a, across a large area. I know that that so was a little it, bit of a joke. Kind of my, I know, know what you mean, but yeah. it's just not very good information to go on when you have these small populations spread across a large area. They don't have a lifestyle like they have a lifestyle very differently, very different from yours. Um, it just doesn't really make sense to think, well, I can eat all these animal products and avoid death from heart disease because like some tribes, people in Africa, uh, can get away with it. You know, you know, for me, just my understanding of like the main culprits of pretty much disease in general, just being not eating whole foods is to me, you know, regardless of whether it's a plant-based diet or an animal-based diet, I'm comfortable with my health in either regard. Oh, okay. Um, but the problem is, you know, these certain animal foods have been proven to increase disease risk. So like it, it would be ideal. I'm sorry, do we, I'm sorry, standpoint. not to interrupt you, but do we want to go back into this or what was like, the not original question? really like, I yeah. mean, we've kind of already covered health, but like, it's kind of hard to talk about this because your ethical standpoint kind of involves, you know, your health beliefs as well. Yeah. Um, but like just assuming like you didn't have these digestive problems and you could do at least as well as the vegans in the Adventist cohort, um, why wouldn't you go on a vegan diet? No, I mean, if, if, if you're saying I would literally be just as healthy as I am now, that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, sure. Then I'd be fine with it. But that is okay. Those that has other problems that I have kind of gone over a couple times. Okay, so you would you would agree then that most people should go vegan? I dude, I just said this 10 minutes ago. Like right, most people yeah, so. in America would be healthier as vegans, unfortunately. That's just how bad the standard American diet is. Okay, well, is, is the vegan diet bad? I think I mean, listen, I go to these like uh, an inter an interesting anecdote here is I go to these like these halal markets, these Muslim markets and a lot of these people I'm the only white guy there, but the reason I'm saying that is because all these people that come from these countries are still consuming their cultural and their indigenous beliefs. And they are, for the most part, very, from what I can see on the outside, physically healthy people. They're, you know, they're skinny, they're muscular, they have, uh, you know, it looks like they had ideal facial proportions throughout the development in their life. And these people that are, why am I bringing this up? Because. Like from what cultures are you talking about? African cultures, mostly. Um, okay, Muslim, well Muslim, Middle Eastern culture. 
they still have high rates of heart disease. Ah, uh, depending on the location, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's the Ugandans who have very low rates of disease, but uh, they eat a corn-based diet. It, it's again, it's hard to say. What What was the original the the original question before that was if most people should be like what you you asked me what's wrong with a vegan diet in general, right? So yeah. the reason I brought that up is because those people that I see at these markets, they're getting this vitamin content in their diet, regardless of what else they're getting. They're sticking to their traditional roots of getting those nutrients. So there might actually be the reason I bring this up because those people that I see in these markets, from my opinion, would be healthier than a vegan because they're getting these high vitamin animal foods. And okay. Well, it's this isn't just about vitamins. Uh, like the macronutrient content of the diet also matters. And um, I know we disagree on this, but saturated fat and cholesterol is definitely linked to heart disease. It is linked to diabetes, uh, certain forms of cancer. Uh, there are also like things like heme iron that increase disease risks. So I think you're focusing too much on vitamins. And if you actually look at the recent data, uh, vegans don't really have higher rates of vitamin or mineral deficiencies. But I, I just, I just don't like... Chat. Well, wait a second. I, I just linked in chat a study that came out of Switzerland recently. Uh, micronutrient status and intake in omnivores, vegetarians, and vegans in Switzerland. Vegans didn't really have any higher rates of deficiencies. I think the one thing they did have higher rates of uh, deficiencies in was zinc. But I, again, like that can just be dealt with just from you know being conscious of the food choices you're making. Uh, I mean, the two problems I have with that are the whole saturated fat and cholesterol thing you're saying contribute to heart disease. I feel like you just need to add in the context of what most Americans are eating, not just those two things in general. And then the second thing of vegans not having nutritional deficiencies, the RDA for vitamin D and is like 400. What is it? And like the actual nanograms per liter spectrum of vitamin D is from like 20 to 100. And like 20 is like you've never been in the sun before. And 100 is like, you're about to die from a vitamin D overdose. So, uh, they're, they're, like the the problem with modern nutritional methods and determining deficiencies, that's not necessarily indicative of what optimal health is. And that's glaringly obvious with, I know vitamin D3, I know in a lot of cases, uh, like calcium is too high as well. Those are two things that are accepted to not be correct for RDA. So to go with RDA for me is difficult to, well, they didn't say. just go like they looked at micronutrient intakes in the study and also status. So um, vegans didn't have any higher rates of like clinical deficiencies. Um, you like you like you also said like you have to take things into context, like with the heart disease and cholesterol thing. Well, again, you linked. Um, uh, a study on the Maasai in Africa, and they had extremely high rates of heart disease, and that's what you'd consider to be an ideal diet, quote unquote. So, but we have to keep like you saying heart disease, but we have to keep in mind when we say heart disease, we mean these Maasai had pretty much exception. They're exceptions to the disease because of the way their arteries adapted and their lifestyle. Well, no, they had high prevalence of the disease, but mortality from the disease was quite low, and as far as the researchers could tell it was because their arteries opened up or something yeah i mean that's as, kind as of older. we need to under like since we don't know these specifics and these things about this disease in the context of those people i don't think we should just like speculate and say that and and you know just say that heart disease does this without clarifying those things about these people that consume these foods okay well the thing is even under ideal circumstances uh it, it's like what you would consider ideal circumstances, things like saturated fat and cholesterol uh, do cause atherosclerosis, clogging of the arteries, plaque buildup. Um, it's just in that one example you gave, like the Maasai, um, it didn't result in increased mortality from heart disease or non-significant increase. Uh, it's like disproportionately. I just, I just don't want to dwell on this too much because, like, I those yeah, was, I, like I, a lot I of these studies that. were like just things I came up I with get on the what spot. You're saying, but I mean, your ethical, like, your perspective on ethics keeps going back to nutrition, and it's quite clear that vegans can get all the nutrition they need. They can live long, healthy lives. So I'm just wondering why you'd 
think like somebody should just needlessly kill animals when because to me it's not clear animals. because i was on a vegan diet for like a couple of weeks and i didn't i don't well, know if that was long enough of a measurement but i just it wasn't even comparable to this diet well again that's an anecdotal claim you only did it for several weeks you mm -hmm. might be an outlier in some sort of way you might have some other underlying problem uh, like among the general population it, it's clear that people can be totally healthy get all the nutrition they need um, the American Dietetics Association released a peer-reviewed report saying vegan diets are healthful, adequate for all stages of life, pregnancy, adulthood, even suitable for athletes. Like, this is well understood and established that vegan diets are nutritionally adequate, healthy, and they even prevent against chronic disease. So I, I'm just still just confused why you wouldn't say, unless you have some sort of weird specific health problem like me, you should eat a vegan diet. Because my whole understanding of this diet and the reason I got into the carnivore diet, it has nothing to do with meat or animals or anything. It had to do with, I started researching like what the healthiest diet was and what the bioavailability of nutrients was. And to my understanding uh, and how I've anecdotally felt and a lot of things I've noticed, it's imperative that I get these vitamins in my diet uh, in certain amounts to feel optimally healthy. That's just, okay. Well, that's my- That's just for you though. I mean, I, I think I would say that as a blanket statement to anyone, they need X amount of these vitamins to be in optimal health, not just avoid deficiencies. Right. Okay. And there's no evidence that vegans can't get an ideal amount of nutrition. No, that's why I don't really argue, well, I don't argue on this point too much because my whole theory of, you know, fat soluble vitamins being, a, well, the most important thing in regards to health and development is not something that, uh, people generally accept or care about as a, as like, they don't place as a, much of an importance on it as I do. That's why it doesn't really sound uh, like my, my point of view makes sense to you. Right. So, uh, assuming vegans can get an adequate amount of nutrition, like for ideal health, you'd recommend that everyone follow that diet if they could. I said that already, man. I said, if okay. I, if my function was the exact same as a vegans was, which it, I mean, in my experience, it hasn't been, then I would do it, but that's, Okay, and you would recommend that sort of thing for vast majority of people if they could stay healthy or be healthier on a vegan diet. If they could, yeah, under that okay. under that condition. Okay, um, I think uh, that's a good point to end it there. Um, yeah, if you have any closing thoughts or whatever you wanted to share. Yeah, I mean, you just you didn't really want to just touch on. I don't know how much of importance this was to just how most people do the carnivore diet or thing, anything specifically in regards to that. Well, I, I mean, really... most people do the carnivore diet pretty terribly. Like I've mentioned this before, but they're not yeah. eating uh, organ meats. And it, it's really, it very clearly is a fad diet the way it's being like marketed. You mean like uh, there's like the ribeye steak every day, that's it? Yeah, basically. The, like the way it's being marketed, it is a fad diet for like short term weight loss. It's not something you should follow long term. And even if you're doing it properly, quote unquote, um, eating like organs, uh, thalamus glands, shit like that to get things like vitamin C, um, it's still terrible for your health. Yeah, you man, I'm doing a I'm doing a video later. It's amazing how almost every organ is incredibly high in vitamin C. But uh uh even even in that context, um yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting that, unfortunately, the, the people that got popular with the carnivore diet are pretty much doing it in, you know, the kind of like the worst way possible. Um, do you think if it wasn't like a an eat steak all day diet and that people weren't so ingrained in that like kind of like closed minded mindset of not wanting to, and, you know, it's a cultural thing too. People don't really want to eat those foods and go out to get them and do the things that I do. You think, I mean, we'd probably be having a much different conversation if that was the case or not. Um, maybe it wouldn't have even, I mean, Probably if that was the case, if that was the diet, it would have never been popular in the first place, right? No. Um, like again, and that's how I like you can tell it's very clearly a fad diet that's just gonna go out of fashion in a few months. Um, it's just appealing to our culture sensibilities where you, you're not really eating any organ meats, it's just like mm -hmm. steak and like, oh, steak is fun food. Mm -hmm. I'm very against that myself, but would you say that uh, keto is a fad diet? Yeah, it like it really is. Um, you know, some people do well on ketogenic diets. Like, you know, it, it can treat epilepsy and shit. Uh, you can do a vegan keto diet, by the way. Um, it's just that. Yeah, I'm from. I'm from like, that, yeah. The only real benefit is for people who suffer from epileptic seizures and people who have a really hard time with caloric control. 
Otherwise, there's really no benefit to the diet. Um, it's not good for reducing heart disease risk, not good for diabetes. Um, I'd say it's not even good for cancer just because the amount but, of fat. But my, my problem is with that, it, what you're saying is when I go on you know, the vegan forum and I look at things, it's a lot about animal rights and then occasionally someone smells because they fart too much. And then when I go on the keto forum, it just seems to be all people that have had these miraculous weight loss stories people talk about reversing their diabetes people talk about how well, again how, these are anecdotal um, claims um i i don't really care about people posting in a forum but people but literally on in the context of the ketogenic diet with just the sheer amount of anecdotes that come up every single day is well, you can find that stuff in the vegan community too like you don't have to look uh, far um it's like these anecdotal claims don't really mean anything but the prevalence um, of them also, in like, also, you have to consider, like, their anecdotal claims. Like, oh, okay, well, oh, like, my diabetes got better. I, I lost weight, all this crap. I feel better. Well, what's, like, show me, like, actual numbers here. Mm -hmm. um, like, again, just saying I don't have to take diabetes medication, That well, that doesn't actually mean you've improved your diabetes. It, you, you can eliminate symptoms of diabetes by eating a zero-carbohydrate diet. Your glucose levels won't shoot up and you won't need to take those medications because your glucose is down but has your insulin sensitivity actually improved not necessarily um usually when people lose weight uh, it improves but uh, again like a, a really high fat diet particularly high in saturated fat it's not going to improve insulin sensitivity uh, unless it's in the context of weight loss but in that in that situation weight loss is what improved insulin sensitivity yeah, I mean, and, and caloric, caloric restriction too uh, yeah. but what, what about what do you think? And I think this is a big problem that doesn't really get said enough in the context of vegan diets when people don't really understand what, like a lot of people will go vegan and do all these things and they'll start seeing their health deteriorate because they don't understand things that they need to supplement and, and various foods they should be eating. And it just gets to a point where like a year or two into the diet, they're literally like almost wasting away because of their lack of knowledge of the diet. Do you think there needs to be like more of an importance in what vegans need to do to be healthy on a vegan diet? Well, I think the majority of people are saying they're wasting away. They're just not eating enough. And mm -hmm. in that circumstance, I just say weigh your food, track your calories. If you're having a hard time eating a high volume of food, just eat more fat. Um, just like peanut butter, avocados, uh, even like coconuts. Mm -hmm. I mean, for some people, especially like the vegan diet with a lot of the different foods people buy in the food volume and you know, I mean, it's same thing with the carnivore diet. Like for people to just go to the supermarket and buy steaks, that's easy. But when they start having to, you know, buy all these different foods, isn't there like a level of effort into doing a proper vegan diet that you think might require like a bit more research and time and effort that some people are willing to do? Well, here's the thing. Like, um, there's a lot of animal products where you generally get your nutrition from, like, um, milk in Canada is probably the biggest source of vitamin D because it's artificially fortified. Um, dairy and salt is also the biggest source of iodine because iodine is added uh, to dairy and table salt. So there's these there's these important nutrients that you need that you'd normally get from like dairy or salt or something like that. Um, and then when you switch to a vegan diet, if you're not getting those like those vitamins or minerals from you know the, the foods you're switching to, like, um, I, I don't think there's any iodine in soy milk. Well, that can be a problem. Um, you know, so you do kind of need to know a, a little bit about this stuff. But uh, generally, I think for most people, you know, just have a diet that has a lot of like, uh, lentils, beans, legumes, uh, some, some grains, a mix of fruits and vegetables, and I definitely say uh, supplement B12, vitamin D. Um, that's usually good for most people, and uh, you know sometimes you do need to uh, make sure you get enough iodine if you're not adding sodium to your diet. Um, so you might want to eat sea vegetables or uh, take an iodine supplement, but it, it it doesn't take too much effort. Um, it's just that you know some people just don't realize these issues they can run into. Yeah, but I mean, like, aren't you concerned about people like celebrities and very popular people? Like, they go vegan, they don't really do it right, and then people find out they're not vegan anymore. That seems to have been happening yeah. a little bit lately. Yeah, like that really annoys me. Um, the I, f I forget her name now. The woman who played Catwoman in the last Batman movie. 
Um, it's she not, said she was. It's not I Gil. I don't want to say. I don't, I'm probably wrong. In, in the last, like, um, like the last in the trilogy in that trilogy, um, I forget her name. But that was uh, a Anne while Hathaway. ago, right? Though. Oh, Anne, Anne Hathaway. Hathaway. She said she was vegan, and then uh, like she wrote some. She she had an interview with someone, and it was really stupid. She said she was only eating tofu and chickpeas, like literally that's it. And then she said, "I I just didn't feel well, so I had to quit veganism." It's like like there's more than tofu and chickpeas. So there's a lot of people who I, I don't know, like maybe they just don't think about what they eat, and literally just here on some blog oh you need to eat chickpeas and tofu to get enough protein or else you'll die and they just do that and then they fail so yeah there's those weird odd like outliers but i i think most people have enough common sense to just eat a sensible vegan diet like have some beans potatoes rice and have a mix of vegetables and fruits and maybe take a, like a multivitamin and they generally do fine I mean, but what I've noticed is those people that you're mentioning, like right now, that are successful on those vegan diets, they tend to have, you know, they put a pretty extensive amount of work into their pantry, into the foods they have. Um, I guess it might just be something that people aren't real. I never really, really have from. like what I eat, like lentils, tofu, uh, just some nori wraps and shit every day. And but like the reason I brought that up is because what do you think about like I don't know if you've seen their videos, like Hench Herbivora has like. A million powders in these jars and stuff and like yeah sure send yeah. The nutrition like, I mean, there's people the same do thing. that but you yeah. don't you don't really need to um mm -hmm. i think my diet is a lot of people like criticize me for that like when i do what i eat in a day vlogs they're like wow dude you eat really fucking boring mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean i just cook up plain lentils maybe put some hot sauce and some uh nutritional yeast on it mm -hmm. eat it that's a meal for me like it's it's very simple and straightforward. Um, I think people kind of overcomplicate things a bit too much. Uh, do you think there's a problem with people like there tends to be like almost like a cookie cutter kind of a lot of foods that people tend to eat in their diet, whether it's avocado or tahini or certain green vegetable, like big giant green vegetable shakes that have, uh, you know, certain uh, a lot of these foods when consumed in large amounts frequently, like are there anti nutrient concerns for people that aren't really soaking or preparing these foods properly? No, generally that's not an issue. Um, what for things like broccoli tofu that it inhibits iodine absorption, uh, like there's phytates and beans and shit that supposedly inhibit iron absorption. Um, your body makes metabolic adaptations to these things where they don't actually affect you. Um, and in the case of things like tofu and broccoli, um, you can just eat more iodine if it inhibits iodine absorption. Uh, normally, this sort of thing isn't an issue for people, but maybe with like higher intakes of certain things, um, it can be a problem, but again, it's it's easily fixed. Uh, no, man, that sounds good. I just had those those few questions in regards to the vegan yeah, stuff. Is sure. there anything else we wanted to touch on? No, uh, I think I just wanted, wanted to summarize things. Like, basically, there's no indication to me that a vegan diet, like, it, like is harmful to health. It, it only has benefits. Uh, I think it's really the way people should be eating. And um, there like there's every indication that diets that are high in saturated fat, cholesterol, animal products, uh, massively increase chronic disease risk. And we see this in every single population, uh, even like pre agricultural hunter gatherers like the Maasai you mentioned, uh, the rates of disease are very high. Um, it's just that, you know, the 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 rates in which they die from these diseases might be low because of other confounding factors. But in modern society, with the way we're living, uh, it's very clear that these foods increase uh, risk of death from these diseases. Uh, yeah, I mean, if there's, I guess, you know, that was a very short summary for the amount of time we've been talking. And there's definitely been some back and forth on each of those points. So I guess uh, if, if people want specific details, most of, most of that stuff was talked about in the first, what, like two and a half hours or so, two hours. Yeah. It's still a pretty long period of time. But the um, initially, we went back and forth a lot on the, what was it, the just the heart disease in general, right? The, the arterial. Went back and forth on that for about an hour. Then we moved on to the heme iron thing for about an hour, pretty much. And then we kind of just summarized the, you know, the vitamins were thrown in between there, not really... Um, not really too much to speculate on. We just kind of speculated on bioavailability a little bit. And then we spoke about just 
kind of moved into the ethical side of things and uh, just kind of uh, how people are not really, you know, they just, I mean, that's how America is, unfortunately, with the whole food production system and just how a lot of other places in the world are kind of slowly creeping towards it at the moment. Okay, sure. Um, so uh, thanks for having the debate. Uh, it definitely went better than some other ones I had recently. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks for being on. I'll uh, link your channel in the description of this video. Uh, I'm also going to re-upload the live stream to my main channel once it's done mm -hmm. processing. And um, if you want to upload uh, this debate to your channel, you can just download it from me. Like, yeah, like Clip Converter. Yeah, just uh, yeah. It. Okay. Okay, cool. So uh, thanks, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the debate.